you are very welcome to this guest lecture and a very well warm welcome to you, Martin, from Bon Touch. Thank you. Uh, this will be exciting. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of interesting lectures coming up in uh, iOS development, Android development. Uh, but first off, Martin, w uh, what is Bon Touch and uh, who are you? And yeah, tell me. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks for being here. And we're super excited to do all these lectures for you. And uh, yeah, we, we think we have some really good things in store. And uh, yeah, OneTouch is a, a Swedish digital innovation agency that builds a lot of apps. And uh, you will hear more about them in, in later uh, lectures. But we build some of the biggest apps in Sweden, such as Swish and PostNord and SJ and a lot of other apps. Uh, and I just wanted to pop in and say that, uh, hi, I'm Martin. I'm heading up the Kalmar studio. We have a studio in Kalmar with about 20 employees. And uh, we are super excited to be in Kalmar. And we want to reach out and, and have contact with students, of course. So if you have any interest in, in um, mobile development or app development of any kind, uh, please let me know. And uh, I'm available in, in your Slack channels. So yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, that's all for me. And I want to ha um, hand over to my colleague uh, Philip, who will, who will do the first uh, lecture. So have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin. See you around. And hello, Philip. Uh, so nice to meet you. Uh, so uh, tell tell me who is Philip, and uh, yeah, please start. Uh... Yeah, sure. If you if you throw up my my slides. There we go. Yeah, I will talk about iOS development today. And uh, together with my colleague, Joan, we will try to teach you as much as possible in the coming 45 minutes. So as uh, Joan just said, there's a schedule for uh, today. And I will talk about iOS development. And I will also talk about the Swift programming language. Then. Johan, my colleague, will talk about Swift UI and go into architecture and uh, what you need to think about when you do mobile development. They will be followed by uh, Android development and Jetpack Compose, which is the equivalent to Swift UI on the Android side, where you uh, the framework that you use to create UI. And lastly, you will learn about cross-platform technologies when it's a good idea to go with cross-platform and when it's a better fit to go with a native uh, app instead. We'll also go into some React Native. So the presenters. Perfect, perfect. Philip, I, I will just say one thing uh, before we start. And, and please feel free to, to ask questions in the YouTube uh, chat. So, so I will monitor that chat. I will kind of make sure that all your questions get heard so somewhere, maybe in the end of each lecture or something like that. But please go ahead and ask questions if you like. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect, Johan. Perfect. Yeah, definitely. Do ask questions at, at any time. And and I want to also make it clear that that all the slides that we show, uh, all the example code, the, the example projects that you'll see, we'll make sure to, to send them over to Johan and, and he can make them available to you later as well. So do ask questions right in the chat. Uh, if you have questions uh, at a later time, perhaps you do some sort of project with iOS or Android or with React Native or cross-platform, uh, feel free to reach out to us. It's very easy to, to do that. It's just first name, last name, and at bontouch.com. So uh, this is me. and. Uh, I got into iOS development back in 2012. Uh, I took a software course, which was like a project course, where we were able to, to kind of do whatever we wanted. And uh, so together with a few classmates, I made a game that I'll show you a bit later. It was a whale game where you controlled a whale using your voice. So we extracted the pitch frequency from the microphone. And if you made a high pitch sound, the whale would swim upwards. And if you made a low frequency sound, the whale would swim downwards. And that's kind of where I got in love with this sort of native development and really the possibility to use uh, the sensors that were available on these devices. So at the moment, I'm the tech lead for the Swish applications that I, I guess a lot of you use. And uh, I've been up on touch since 2014. 
So, the next 40 minutes, this is really what I'm going to cover here. I will talk about why we are here at all at LNU, and I will give a brief history about iOS, the iPhone platform iOS, and try to give a, a, a hint at least of where this is heading in the future. Uh, then we'll really go into to, uh, what, why you are here, which is iOS development. And I will talk about the prerequisites that you need, like what, what sort of tools do you need, uh, what knowledge do you need to get started with iOS development. I will give you an introduction to Swift, the programming language, which is used for iOS development. And we will be fetching some random cats from off the internet, and I'll teach you how to do that. And finally, we'll talk about how you can deploy your own iOS applications, both to your own phones, but also to the phones of others by distributing it to them. So let's talk about why we are here. And when I say we, I'm talking about Bontouch, the company that we are from, and here at LNU giving this lecture. So as Martin has said, we're from a company called Bontouch. And perhaps you've heard of us, perhaps you have not. Uh, but we make a lot of popular apps, so I would bet that a lot of you will at least have some of your, our apps in, in, uh, on your phone. Perhaps you use Postnor to uh, get information about your partial deliveries, Swish to send money, SJ to book your tickets uh, with, with trains. So when I started, we were about 20 people. We had one studio in, in Stockholm. Uh, and today, about seven uh, years later, we're about 200 people. We have studios in New York, we have studios in, in London, Östersund and Åre. Stockholm, of course, is still left and also in Kalmar. So for the students that are tuning in from Kalmar, there is a Bontage office there. So what are we then? Um, we're not really a software startup in the sense that we're a startup anymore. We've been around for more than 10 years now. But what we kind of try to label us is, as is a startup as a service. And what does that mean then? So we're, we like to team up with technically, what do you say, non-tech brands like SJ or Postnord. And together with them, we put together a team from, from our company with all the competences that you need for modern app development. So we're not a consultancy in the sense that uh, a company hires us and say, we want Johan, we want Philip, and we want them to work on our team over here. Instead, we work from our own offices, at least when we work from offices. Now, a lot of us work remotely, of course. But we supply entire cohesive teams of engineers, of designers, of project management, of product ownership that work together with our partners. So we work from our office together with our designers, and we really supply all those competences. So why are we here then? So we're here because we're really passionate about what we do. And we want to make more people excited about building high quality mobile applications. So it is truly amazing to be able to both design and code something that millions of people can bring with them in their pocket. So we do primarily native development. And that's really what I'm personally really passionate about. And as I said earlier, native development is a lot more than, you know, like a cool UX with, with flashy animations. We have access to so many sensors on these devices, like the camera, the microphone. You can do advanced computer visions using the LiDAR. And what I want to, to you to take away from this is that native development is a broad topic that is not only creating a UI, but you can do a lot of really advanced stuff in native development. So from there, I just want to give a really brief history about iOS, and I promise you we'll get into iOS development for real, really soon. So iPhone is introduced, 2007. I mean, look at that little cute device. Uh, at, at that time, it couldn't per really, uh, there was no app store which is really what, what set all of these uh, app developer uh, companies in motion, right? So in 2008, the App Store is introduced. And 
During just 2020, last year, people spent $72 billion on the App Store and another $38 billion on the Android Google Play Store. And that is a lot of money. And most of it goes out to the developers creating the apps. And it has really increased a lot since the introduction of the App Store and is continuing to increase. People spent more than 30% more in 2020 than in 2019 on uh, apps on the App Store. So there's a lot of money to be made there, even for indie developers creating their own apps. And that being said, when we created this amazing game called Killer Whales, uh, I am not an app millionaire, but for sure this paid a couple of beers while we studied. Um, when we did this game, the programming language that we used uh, was Objective-C. And Objective-C, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is a superset of C. So you can still program C, but it has object-oriented features on top of it. Uh, going forward, which was really when Apple shocked everyone in 2014 by introducing Swift. So Swift is really the new programming language that replaces Objective-C this really old school language that's been largely unchanged since the 1980s. Uh, and Swift is much more modern, more easier to understand. It has automatic memory management and it's really, really cool language. So I'll go into Swift and try to teach you at least the basics of it uh, in, in just a second. Another cool thing is that in 2015, Apple made Swift open source, and there's right now a really big open source community developing this language and, and, and adding new features to it every year. There's, of course, a bunch of stuff that happened in between here, but my own personal uh, preference or, or what I really think is cool is that Apple spent a lot of time adding AR kit which is Augmented Reality Kit, which makes it so much simpler for developers that perhaps don't have all these, you know, uh, OpenGL and really advanced knowledge of how to do uh, augmented reality. So ARKit makes it so much simpler. And I don't know if you've seen it, but in the PostNord app, for example, you can uh, tap on a parcel and in there you can see uh, a button that says Visualize Your Package. And if you tap that, you can visualize your package, how big it is, in augmented reality, like in your room. Will this fit into my car, for example? In 2018, Core ML is introduced. And Core ML references uh, machine learning. And this is really cool. So in, what it means is that you can both create your own machine learning models, and they have programs to make that so much simpler than it was before. And you can run them locally on device using the, the machine learning processor on device. Uh, to, to really uh, take advantage of that framework and build really cool stuff with it. Another really cool thing that happened in 2019, Swift UI is introduced. So Joan will talk, teach you all about Swift UI in the next session, but it changed everything how UIs are built. And it's much more modern. And if you come from a web background, perhaps using React, you will feel right at home building uh, apps using Swift UI. And another highlight in 2021, major updates to the Swift programming language, uh, and it added so much great features to it, but primarily the addition of async await and actors. So if you're familiar with, with the JavaScript, there's been async await in JavaScript for quite some time. So this is not, you know, some revolution in, oh, this is the new, new like the, um, how do you say? It's not really the, um, some brand new stuff in the programming world, but it's brand new to Swift and it changed a lot in how easy it is to do concurrency programming. Just a quick brief look at this. So uh, iOS, it's about 50-50 in Sweden, but Android, if you look at the world, uh, has a big lead in market share. I'll not talk about more about that. So let's dive into native app develop and talk about Swift and what you need and stuff like that. So before we do that, I just want to talk about what is native app development and how does it differ from, from other sorts of development? So the term native app development, it refers to building a mobile app 
exclusively for a single platform and using the programming languages and tools that are specific for that platform. So for iOS, for example, that means you use Swift. That means that you use Swift UI or UIKit, which is the older framework for building UI. Uh, that's how you build a native app. If you use JavaScript and perhaps do a React Native app, uh, as, even though the name might imply it's a native app uh, and, and React Native compiles to native, it's still cross-platform and it's not really the tools that are designed for building a native app. So, iOS development prerequisites. What do you need? You need a Mac. So if you, if you have a Mac, that's great. You are halfway to an iOS developer already. So if you don't have a Mac, uh, and I didn't when I started with iOS development, so I managed to install a virtual machine running Mac OS on, on my computer. It was a bit laggy. It crashed a lot. But I mean, it worked good enough to create an app. So if you want to just try this out, that might still be an option for you. But if you have a Mac, that's great. You're halfway there. Next thing you need, you need to install Xcode. So Xcode is the IDE, which is the integrated development environment that you need to create iOS applications. So iOS applications is kind of what we say, but there's also, you know, iPad OS, Mac OS, Watch OS, and also TV OS. But you use Xcode to build applications for all of them. So Xcode is made by Apple and it has its own set of quirks. And Joanne will show you Xcode in, in the next hour as well and how to use it. So let's talk about Swift now which is the programming language that you need to learn in order to do iOS development. I mean, you could still learn Objective-C. It's old school. It will take you a longer time and it's kind of becoming deprecated if it's not considered that already. So I would really encourage you to go with Swift directly. So what is Swift? If you're familiar with JavaScript, which is an interpreted language, Swift is a compiled language, just like Java. It is open source, as I said, and it has automatic memory management. And like Apple uh, prefer to call like most of their product, you know, it just works. And automatic memory management is kind of like that. It just works, but you need to understand how it works. Um, so just like the garbage collector in Java, you need like, for most part, you don't really need to worry about it, but sometimes you do. And it's kind of the same thing here. You have type inference, and I will talk about that. I will talk also about type safety, which is a feature in the Swift programming language. Optionals, if you are not familiar with optionals, I will cover that too. And you have closures. There's, of course, a bunch of other stuff in Swift, like generics, which are re it's a really cool topic. But if you know these things and how that works, then you are all set to start building your own application. If you want to go into, like, learn more about Swift, uh, and when you get these slides in a PDF later, you can tap this link and it will take you to the Swift programming language guide. And it is fantastic. Uh, you can learn everything from, you know, as it says here, basic operators, all the way to really, really complex concurrency stuff. So great guide if you want to learn more about that. So I also want to add that you can use Swift for a lot of things. It's not only for, for iOS development. You can build command line tools. You can do backend development. But what we're going to mainly focus about, uh, focus on in this session and the next one is iOS development, of course. So in conclusion, you need a Mac, you need Xcode, and you need to learn Swift. So let's go ahead and, and talk about Swift. And like Linus Torvalds usually says, talk is cheap, show me the code. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. So the basics of Swift and all the code that I'm going to show you on, on the next slides uh, is going to build up to this amazing app. So at the end of this session, you will have learned enough Swift to build this app yourself. And what happens here is that you can tap that button down there that says new cat, and it's going to go out to an API called the cats as a service uh, or cats on demand, I believe. And 
it will download a new cat and it will show it on the screen. And this is all the code. And don't look at this code right now. We're going to go through it later. But this is all the code that's required to download this cat image from the internet. There's, of course, a UI part to it, which I won't cover, but Johan will teach you about SwiftUI later. But this is all the code that's required to download this cat from the internet. So let's dive right in. And as tradition dictates, when you learn a new programming language, you must learn how to print Hello World. And this is how you do it in Swift. So this might look like, you know, it's a one line of code, it says print, that seems pretty straightforward. But there's a few things to note here. First of all, there's no semicolon. So in Swift, no semicolons to denote the end of a line. Another thing that's pretty cool is that this is actually an entire Swift program because code written in global scope in Swift, it is used as the entry point to the program. So you don't need a main function at all. Moving on, let's talk about types in Swift. And type inference. So this is pretty straightforward, right? You have an implicit integer and it's 70 or an implicit double and it's 70.0 or an explicit double. So in Swift, that will infer the type int to that variable. And it's not very complicated, right? Because that's of course a double too, because the default floating point uh, type in Swift is a double. So this is not very complicated, but let's look at the next example here then. So in JavaScript, you could kind of do this, right? You, you, you first have an integer and then all of a sudden let's assign it to uh, a string. But this is a type safe language, as I said. So you cannot assign the value of string to int. Nothing really more to say there. So that's still pretty simple. Let's look at a, a lot bigger example. So here, it is pretty simple if, if you look at it, right? You have an array here uh, of integers and you loop over them with this for loop. And this is how you write a for loop in Swift or one of the ways to write a for loop in Swift. And depending on the score, you, you add it here and then you print out the score. But there's a few things still to note here. First of all, let's look at the difference here. You have let and then you have var. So let is like const in, in C or, or JavaScript or Objective-C if you're familiar with that, or like final in, in Java. Uh, and that means that if you assign it to something, you cannot assign it to something else. It's a constant, it's fixed, and you can't change it. Var, on the other hand, you can change. So we also have examples of type inference here. That's an array of integers. And that's, of course, an integer that you can add stuff to here. Cool. Let's move on. Structs and classes, which are two uh, uh, ways to store data or to data types in, 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 uh, in Swift. So a struct, like in many other languages, or sorry, a class or an object of a class, like in many other languages, are passed by reference, like, just like in Java. So, but an instance of a struct, it is passed by value. And besides from that, structs and classes in Swift are much more similar than they might be in other languages. You could, for example, uh, you, could, you could add a protocol that, which is the same thing as an interface in Java and have uh, the resolution struct implemented and the class also implement that same protocol. You can have functions inside of structs. You can have even mutating functions that mutates the inner parts of the struct without you actually changing the outer value that's captured it. And another thing that you, you can note here is that if you look at the class on line 10, you have the variable name, which is a string question mark, which is, you know, string. Is this, what is that? And this is actually an optional. So what that means is that the name is either a string, for example, the name Philip, 
or Kalmar or Växjö. Um, or it is nil or null, which is the same thing. So the use of optionals are quite powerful and it makes it a lot easier to write safe code. So, you know, like in Java, for example, if you have a name and, you know, no optionals or anything, and it's a string and you, for example, you want to access, I want to see how many uh, characters there is in this, uh, are in this string. So you go name.length and perhaps your program will, will, uh, will crash because there was no name. And this is way easier to avoid those kinds of bugs in Swift. And I will show you how you handle optionals right now. Or, sorry, uh, this is just a way to, to, to show this, the, uh, um, a function on the resolution. For example, you can print, you can add, add any functions or, or protocols, as I said. And structs are really cool. And I uh, want to add this as an exploration topic to, to you. So when you get these slides, you can tap this exploration topic and it will take you to a great tutorial to, to learn more about structs and how memory management works, mutation, uh, protocol conformance, and even extendability to these structs. So now let's talk about optionals and how to handle them. So this is a function. And if you look at it, it's pretty simple. It uh, The function is called add, and it takes a parameter first number that's of type integer, and the second optional number, which is type int, or int question mark, which is an optional integer. So what would happen here on line six? You say add and you put in one here and then you spend in nil. In some languages, nil might be interpreted as zero, but in Swift, this would get you a compile time error because the value of optional type integer question mark must be unwrapped to a value of integer to actually perform this addition operator. So let's look on, uh, at how that can be done. The compiler, when you get this compile time error, this here, is going to suggest like, oh, do you want to force unwrap this? Which is this exclamation point right here. So what this does is that it takes the integer and uh, or the, the optional integer, and it just says, okay, I am certain this is an integer. There will never be nil. And this is kind of bad, you know, because you will get rid of the compile time error, but this is going to, to crash in runtime instead, which is worse. So forced unwraps, which is that exclamation mark, is in most cases a sign of code smell or a lazy developer that didn't really care enough about error handling. So let's look at a way to handle this better. One way to do that is to use this if let statement. So here, what will happen is that if the second optional number actually is an integer and not nil, it will be assigned here and this line will evaluate to true and you will go down here, you can add it and print the sum. If it, this is not an integer, which is the case here, since we send in nil, it will print second number was nil, which is exactly what this program here is going to print. Another way to do this is using something called a guard statement. And this is what it looks like. When we read this line of code, the way to read it is kind of, let's protect ourselves against something. So it's kind of, guard or kind of make sure that this is an integer or that this resolves to an actual integer. If it does not, then we use this else statement and you're going to print second number was nil, which is what this is going to print when you send it in. But if it is, then down here, second number will be an actual integer, not an optional integer. And if you compare these two cases, you can say that this, uh, pr the guard statement kind of and forces you to do early returns, which is uh, in many cases a way to make your code more readable. Cool. Let's move on to error handling because we need to know about error handling if you're going to download stuff from the internet. So it's a big, pretty big example. 
uh, but we'll go through it line by line here. First, an enum up here. And it, what this means is that it's this implements a protocol, which is, you know, as I said, the same thing kind of as an interface in Java. And error is a Swift type, like in part of Swift foundation that signifies that this is uh, something that is an error. And actually you can have a struct that is an error. You can have a class that is an error. But in a lot of cases, it's very convenient to have an enum as an error because then you can add multiple cases to it. So we have vending machine error, and this is our vending machine. And as you know, in a vending machine, you can tap a number and you get something out of it. So in this vending machine, we just have three items. So on index zero, you have soda, then you have a candy bar, and then you have popcorn. And then you have a function here that gets an item out of this list based on an input index. So it returns a string, which is what this error uh, indicates, but it's also marked as throws, which is a way to indicate that this function can throw an error. And I want to make it clear that this throws here is not exception handling as you have in Java. You could, you know, access the index out of bounds and then capture that exception. This is not that. If you access an index out of bounds in, in Swift, it will crash. And that's it. So this is error handling instead. So in your vending machine, if the user taps, I want something from index three, like in this example here, you need to mark it as try. You need to wrap everything that you do something with a try so you can catch the error in a do catch statement. So you try to access something at index three, which is, you know, out of bounds, you go in here and we have this guard statement and this is going to throw an error because it's out of bounds. So it's not more complicated than that actually. So let's move on to concurrency because as we need to download, you know, images and stuff from the internet, you need to be able to handle concurrency. And as I said, during the, the brief history, um, a sync await was just added to Swift. So it's brand new in Swift. And to this day, I don't think there's a single app uh, built by third party developers that's actually been released using a sync await because Xcode was just uh, out of beta with this uh, addition to the language. So uh, if you're familiar with a sync await in JavaScript, the syntax is very, very similar. What you do here is that you fetch a remote cat image uh, and it's marked as async. So this is, you know, a keyword for this function. And this can also throw because, you know, for example, if you try to download something and uh, it fails for some reason, perhaps your URL was wrong, perhaps the server was down at that specific second, perhaps the user with this phone downloading this cat image just uh, were on the subway and entered a tunnel or something. So it can throw an error. It's marked as async because it's going to do some concurrency work. So this is kind of how you get that image then, which became, you know, very linear in, in that sense that it's just say, wait until we get that image. And when you have that image, you can show it on the screen. Otherwise, you know, catch the error and preferably do something better than print it, perhaps show an alert to, to the user. And if you're interested in concurrency and, you know, um, um, multi-thread, multi-core programming, Perhaps you want to do a master thesis with us uh, at Bon Touch or even in, in, in Kalmar or in Stockholm. Um, we have a topic for that, which is evaluating Swift concurrency and to get a more deep dive you know, into different ways to handle concurrency in Swift. Uh, we have a lot of other uh, master thesis topics. Um, perhaps you're interested in, in computer vision. Perhaps you want to do some TensorFlow and, and machine learning with that. Uh, perhaps you're interested in, you know, the low level of, of uh, memory management. So we have a lot of, of stuff to choose from. Perhaps you have your own ideas of a master thesis that you want to do. Um, when you get these slides, you can tap this slide here or go directly into our website, bontouch.com, and apply for a for, uh, thesis. Next up. Let's talk about actually downloading stuff from the internet. 
URL session is the uh, most convenient way. It's part of foundation as well in Swift. Uh, the most simple, simplest way to actually download stuff from the internet. And let's first look at line three and over here, data and header. And in sort of parentheses with a comma here, uh, if you're familiar with Python, for example, this is a tuple. So this thing will return not one value, but two values. And you will get the data and you will also get the response header once this finish. So line by line, you have a URL and this is the URL to the cat API. As I said, is this code smell? Yeah, perhaps, um, since we're force unwrapping it. But we know, you know, this is the actual format for a URL. So we know this is going to result to a URL. So in this case, it could be considered fine. You create a URL request, which is also a foundation uh, type. And then we get the data. URL session shared, so this is a singleton. And you download the data. Once you have downloaded it, you get the data, you get the response header. If this fails, as I said, perhaps you went into a tunnel or something, this would throw an error and this will never be set. All the lines below it will never be executed and that error will be thrown to the call site, which needs to handle that error. So, cool. Uh, what this actually does is that it downloads JSON data. It, not, it doesn't download the actual image, but it downloads data uh, or JSON that contains a reference to that image. So in this case, this data will resolve to, to this JSON uh, array object. So you have an array and in here you have breeds, ID, the URL that we actually care about, the width, the height of the image. Um, so how do you get that into actually a URL that you can use? Like, how do you get this URL? And to, to understand that, we need to talk about something called decodable. Decodable in Swift is a protocol, like an interface in JavaScript, in, in Java. And the way you do that is that as soon as something implements decodable, you can take something like data and decode it into this struct. And every type here that you see, an array of strings, which is this breed, the ID, which is also a string, and this URL, which we know is a URL, all these types here that is provided by, by, by Swift also implements decodable, which means that a struct containing only properties where each property implements decodable is also decodable. But as I said, we don't really care about anything besides from this URL, right? So let's get rid let's not parse out all that data. Let's just get the URL straight away. And this is the way you do that. So you say you get a cat response, it's decodable, and it will contain a URL. Okay. This is the way you parse it. So the first three lines here is the same thing you saw on, on the earlier slides. You download the data. Now you have the data. Perhaps you should, you know, check the response status code, the HTTP status code of the header. Um, but you don't really have to in the sense that if this data actually can be decoded into a cat response, you're, you're, you're finished and don't really care if the HTTP header said, you know, um, bad request or internal server error as long as it returned the correct data. So this can fail, you know, if this uh, response was not on the format that you expected. So we need to mark it as try. JSON decoder, uh, another object that's part of, of, of foundation, and you decode it. And this thing here, where you say it's an array of cat responses dot self. This thing here references the type array cat response. Because if you see here on the response, this is actually an array of responses for this case, for this specific API. That is why, that is why we are parsing an array of cat responses from this data. If it fails, 
an error will be thrown. You need to handle it at the call site. Otherwise, you will actually have cats here, the array of cats, and then you can get the first one if you want to. So what changed here? Since I said we don't care about the header, you can mark that with an underscore to, to just, you know, I don't care about this. It will be whatever. Let's trash it. So now we have... Can I, can I ask a question, Philip? We've, we got a question from David uh, regarding the URL request. Uh, uh, is is yes. that a sync and we don't need to specify it because it looks like it's synchronous in this case? This thing? Uh, yeah, the URL request. Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, the creation of the U of the URL request. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the creation of the URL request is is not really uh, it's not making the network call at all. It is more like you have the URL, and in order to actually you know make that request, you create a request object. Um, and why you do that is because, you know, the URL request can also consist, consist of uh, perhaps request headers that you want to add to it. So, you know, you have the URL, perhaps you have an authentication header that I will show, show actually show in the example, uh, and, and a bunch of other stuff that you can add to the request, like what is the time, uh, the, the um, like you can tell the request to, you know, I only want to wait at maximum five seconds for this. If I don't get the answer in five seconds, then you know, trash it. So, yep, did that answer the question, yeah, perhaps? Yeah, and yeah, and the URL session is the one that is actually uh, asynchronous in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Nice. Um, okay. Cats on demand demo because we have learned enough Swift to actually uh, to actually download this cat. So let's look at the demo, and this is a video. I hope. This is a video. So this is me running it from Xcode. And here we are. You see a spinner there that's downloading the cat. Oh, look at that cat. New cat. So, and this is running in the iOS simulator, which is part of Xcode. So this is not an actual device. It's just a simulator, but you can build to your own device if you want to. Cool. So now let's look at the code for this. And I hope you can see this, even though it might be a bit small, but I will go through it kind of line by line. So you have this published property here, and Joanne will talk about published. But what it actually is, is that the UI can observe changes to cat URL. So the UI can like hook up itself and say, okay, when anything changes with cat URL, I want to be notified about it if it becomes nil, if it uh, gets a value. And this is the URL to the image. Okay. Then we have an enum here, which is cat error that implements the protocol error. And the only error case that we have right now is that we found no cats. And I will show you how that can happen in, in just a second. We have the struct that I just showed you with the URL to the cat image. And this is the actual function that's doing the heavy lifting. That it, this function is called from the UI when the user taps new cat. It is asynchronous and it can throw an error. Okay. When the cat URL is set to nil, that is when you get the spinner because the UI got notified, something changed. And if it's nil, let's show a spinner. That's kind of what the UI is going to say. We create a request that is down here. And here's the header that I talked about because I had to create an API key to actually get this cat. So we create the request and we set this header to it. Okay, so now we have the request. Still nothing asynchronous happening here. This is just, you know, get the request that I want to use the, on the URL session. Okay, fetch the array of cat responses. As I said, this can fail for any network reason um, that can happen. Perhaps you just set your phone to flight mode or something. Let's await this data from this request. Don't care about the response header in this case. We get the data, we parse it just as I talked about. And if it's, uh, you know, wrong format, perhaps you didn't get the URL, then this would throw an error and we're finished. 
and that UI needs to handle that error. Okay, this is of type cat response array. So let's just get the first cat that we had. If there is no first cat, so this is kind of accessing the array at uh, index zero. Um, but, okay. Um, but it is an optional first. So if there is an index, this is kind of saying, do we have at least count one and then access that, uh, that place in the array? And if we have a first cat, then take that URL, assign it to cat URL, which is the published property that is going to be shown on screen. And when that happens, you will get a cat there. Cool. And that's it. If there are uh, no questions on this, I'm just going to, to briefly, briefly talk about how you can deploy your own app because I noticed we're kind of running out of time here. So deploy your own app. So you can build to your own iPhone. And if you have tried to do this perhaps a few years ago, uh, you came to the part, okay, I need to register for the developer program. And you realized that was really expensive. It was like a billion dollars. Uh, it's not anymore. Now it is free. So you can register for free and you download Xcode, you log into your account, you plug in your iPhone to the app you've created, and then you select your device in that list and you build to it. And that's fine. It will work for about two weeks uh, and then you need to build it again. And that is kind of because Apple wants you to pay for the developer program uh, and not just, you know, distribute apps to, to, to everyone that plugs in your, your, uh, their phone to your computer. Distributing your app, you know, when you build a web page, you, you, you can use any hosting services and just put it up there and everyone can use it. This is a big topic on iOS. It's a steep learning curve and, and I could talk for two hours how to, do, to distribute your app. But there, I have links to it uh, in, in this presentation if you want to know how to actually do this. But you need to get a paid Apple account to distribute your app so that others can download it uh, from, uh, from an, uh, with an internet connection. There's something called ad hoc distributions, which is one way to distribute your apps. That requires you to collect all device identifiers, like unique tokens for all the devices that you need to install this to. Um, it's kind of old school. What people mostly use right now is something called test flight distribution. Um, there's, as you can see, there's links to how to do that here in the, in the presentation. Or the third option, release your app to the App Store. And uh, to do that, you need to go through like a review process with Apple and, uh, and it, takes, uh, it takes a while. But uh, it is really nice to have an app on, on, on the, the App Store. I can, uh, can really recommend it. And that's kind of it for me. This is the, uh, the end of the lecture. So if there are questions or comments, now would be the time. Yeah, thank you, Philip. <clears throat> yeah, it's really interesting. And especially for me as coming from a JavaScript background, it's, I mean, you can see the similarities and, and, and also some great additions that are, are, are missed in, in, in JavaScript. So, so, so interesting to see. We had a question from Tamim and so no way to program in Swift with Windows. And this is, uh, yeah, you can answer. As yeah, yeah. So uh, if we only talk about programming with Swift on Windows, that is actually possible now. I think it was made available like last year or something, last year or, or, or two years ago. But when it comes to developing an iOS application, what you need is Xcode. And Xcode is a native Mac uh, app. So uh, you can program Swift, but you will not be able to really distribute your app from Windows. Um, but you can, I mean, the, the, the way that, that I did when I, 2012, install a, a virtual machine with Mac OS, um, I, I think it can still be done. Perfect, thank you. I have a question as well. How, uh, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the web background, so, so I love working with the, the, the standardized web APIs and things like that. And there is a cost to that. And the cost is, of course, it's a slow process. Uh, I mean, when, when the, the phones are, are, are adding new sensors, they might end up in the web APIs eventually, but it could act, take a couple of years or even longer. 
Mm -hmm. So that is, I guess, one of the really big advantages of working with iOS natively uh, or with Swift. So, so have you any? If you if you were to guess, do you have any like dream sensors coming up <laughs> on the horizon? <laughs> like this would be so cool if we could like get a sensor for this or that. Um. I, I can talk about one, one of the coolest sensors, at least, that, that, that just kind of came out uh, recently. Um, the LiDAR, which is uh, a way to do... Uh, you can use your phone, and, and with it, the, the, with the LiDAR sensor, you can get kind of uh, distance mappings to... to, to um, I can stop my screen sharing, perhaps. There we go. Yeah. Um, to other things in your room, which means that you can kind of, you know... Uh, film an object and then take all that data and and kind of um, how do you say you you can visualize that object uh, on your phone so you can kind of get a 3D printing kind of sense of things using that sensor and and I've seen some really really cool stuff um, made with it even from developers that just been playing around with it at at their office yeah and so, and, and, and it's I, I, yeah, and it looks like it's so high res as well. When when they compare it to like professional equipment for hundred thousand of krona, it still measures more or less at a tenth of a millimeter. The same, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really really amazing. So uh, it, it's it's hard for me to say what, what a dream sensor is, yeah. but I think like <laughs> more stuff like that and, and make that easier to use for developers that might not come, you know, from a really like. 3D computing heavy background, mm. um, which, for an example, I said AR Kit is a great example of that. It is super easy to get started with without kind of any any prior knowledge to how 3D rendering is done. Mm. Perfect. Thank you so much, Philip. I think we will have a short break, uh, and then uh, Johan will talk about uh, UI, right? Uh, Swift UI. Yes, yeah, Sw Swift UI. Yeah. Perfect. That would be interesting. Uh, thank you for, for doing this. Uh, and uh, normally we have a big applause, but you, you will have to thank Philip in the chat instead. So <laughs> thank you uh, for, for uh, coming. Uh, and let's thank have, you for a me. Yeah, have a short break.
And just like that, we are back. Uh, let's see, uh, Yuan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can and you I hear can me? Hear you fine. Perfect. So, yeah, let's continue this iOS topic and go over to Swift UI, I guess. Yeah. Sweet. So let's get started then. Uh, right. So I will talk. Uh, about Swift UI today and how that can be structured in terms of architecture. And uh, I will do a small walkthrough of an example app where we talk about the different parts uh, more in detail and some best practices. And also feel free to interrupt me anytime for questions. Uh, but before we kick off, here's a small introduction of myself. Uh, I've been doing iOS development since 2013, and I worked at Bond Touch the last two years, and I work as an iOS lead in the Filtrit project. And in a past life, I used to be a freelance musician, slapping the bass, but now I mostly code apps. Uh, right, so back to the presentation. So what is Swift UI? Uh, SwiftUI is Apple's new declarative framework for building user interfaces. So it's available on all Apple platforms. So that includes uh, iOS and macOS, Apple Watch and Apple TV. Right, so what does declarative mean? And more specifically, what does declarative programming mean? So here we have a pretty formal explanation that states that declarative program is a programming paradigm that expresses the logic of computation without describing its control flow. So this sounds a bit daunting. So let's look at the more concrete example. So here we have some code that loops through an array and try to extract all the numbers that are even. Uh, so Nothing really wrong with this. This is typically how we like to think about code and very much like the computer does as well, instruction by instruction. And this is one of the more common programming paradigm called imperative programming. Uh, so how would this look in a more declarative fashion then? Something like this. So here instead we use a function called filter and we can use that on the array to achieve the same thing. So here we simply describe what we want, but we don't necessarily describe how to get it. And as opposed to the imperative way where we tell the compiler step by step what should happen. So with this knowledge, we can describe Swift UI like this. Uh, with Swift UI, we can simply state what our user interface should do. Uh, right, so this all sounds good, but how does this actually look in code and on the screen? But first off, a small and quick history lesson. So since iOS 2, we have had another framework for building user interfaces in iOS, which is named UIKit. And UIKit is written in Swift's predecessor, Objective-C. And UIKit is still very much alive and will be for a long time. And this is actually what Swift uses under the hood for the actual rendering of the views. And uh, here we also have a view in UIKit. And in Objective-C, most things are classes, and it makes heavy use of class inheritance. And uh, however, in Swift UI is a framework written for Swift, which means that we can take advantage of uh, some more modern features, features of the language, such as uh, trailing closures and result builders and value types. And it encourages us to use protocols uh, instead of subclassing. So here we have an example of a Swift UI view instead. And here we have, uh, here the view is a protocol instead of a class, and we describe our view using a struct. 
which is a value type instead of a reference type that we saw before. And this is both faster and cheaper um, than using a reference type, and it gives us some clearer semantics. And as you can see here, we also have the uh, body property here on line two. And this is the only requirement for being a view in Swift UI. And this is pretty similar to how the uh, render function works in React. So next up, let's look at some vanilla Swift UI view examples. So here we have a grid of Japanese recipes. And each of these grid items consists of a food view here. And we can build on top of that. So we can compose our food view and put them into stacks. So first we can put our two food views in a horizontal stack, and then we can wrap our horizontal stacks into a vertical stack. And we can also configure our views using view modifiers. So we have different view modifiers depending on the type, but these are the sort of generic ones that exist on all views. And one cool thing similar to how the web works is that we have hot reloading, or as we call it, Xcode previews. So here we can actually test our layout in real time without recompiling the app. Uh, unfortunately, this works. Uh, this is a bit buggy for bigger projects, but hopefully Apple will resolve this because it's really nice. Uh, Next up, we have another example. And here we have a date picker with a field that says born, and we can uh, show the selected date from the date picker. And here we use some uh, built in components in Swift UI, such as the form here. And we also have a date picker. Uh, and Using this sort of built-in components is pretty efficient in terms of like development speed and getting something up and running quickly, but it can be pretty tricky to customize. Uh, but we can always like build our own custom implementation. But one good thing about using built-in components is that we get rid of some friction for our users since they're already familiar with a specific component, how, how that looks and feels. Uh, across the system. Uh, speaking of customization, we can uh, bear in mind that this is still a pretty new framework. So we still have some limitations in terms of API coverage and which system components that are available to you in Swift UI. Uh, the good thing here is that we can mix Swift UI and UI kit pretty easily. So we can use uh, Swift UI where it makes sense and we can use UI kit where it makes sense. Uh, note here that we also have a thing called date here, which is a state variable with the at sign. And this is Swift UI's way of driving state changes in the view. And this is called a property wrapper. Um, and property wrapper can be seen as a way to reuse management for a property. So we could, for instance, use a property wrapper that performs thread safe operations for a database, and we can use that in multiple places. And Swift UI uses this quite a lot. Uh, so last example. Here we have an um, idea for a photo sharing app. And we will look at a lot of code here. We don't really have to read this. I just want to show you that we can um, specify define pretty complex layouts using uh, very little code here and uh, it's nice as well cool and now that we looked at some uh, vanilla swift ui examples we might want to uh, see how this actually fits into the bigger picture sort of so let's dig into app architecture uh, and this is a somewhat big and subjective topic, but I will try to do it justice. Uh, right, so Apple doesn't really 
promote any specific architecture, but due to how Swift UI works, some things are already decided for us. Uh, but there's still some gaps to fill, and that's what we'll discuss today. Uh, first off, I think we can have a look at some uh, some good and I guess subjective architecture principles that I think are good to have in mind when we decide which type of architecture we will choose. So first off, an architecture should be a shared knowledge within your team. So when we have multiple people working on the same project, we need to have a shared understanding of its architecture. So otherwise we risk building features in completely different ways, and which makes it really hard for developers to jump between different features. And this will also like lower the threshold and time needed to understand any new piece of code because we already have a mental model of things fits together. Uh, so it should also answer the question where new functionality goes or how does this fit into the overall app itself? Like both where we actually place our code physically, but also how it interacts with other pieces of code. So if we have this in place, we don't really have to think too much about like the connection points for a specific new feature because our architecture can already answer that for us. Uh, yes, then we have testability. So our architecture should enable us to write tests easily. So if we have, if we're able to test our app easily, that's usually a good indicator that our code is decoupled in a clear way. And um, why is this important? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons, uh, I would say. Uh, first off, it gives us a clear understanding of what type of dependencies we have, but also things like lifetime and scope of a specific component. And also if we smear out, for instance, our module and logical all over the framework we happen to use at the moment, for instance, UIKit, it's gonna be really tricky to migrate to something else in the future, such as Swift UI. Uh, we should design our architecture such that every piece of code can access and observe what it needs without taking any unusual steps. So what do I mean by unusual here? Well, an example here would be if we have sort of a list with users and we have detail screen. So you can tap a user and you get into the detail screen. And maybe this detail screen depends on uh, more information that's current that's in the current like user model perhaps we want to know if the user is logged in or not for instance so the question here is how do we actually build this knowledge within our app and how do we connect this to our views and if we don't address this we could end up with something that's really not a whole app really but small silos of things instead. So like silos that does one thing well, but it doesn't really communicate or respond well. Uh, right, so next up, context is key. So maybe you read about some cool new architecture with a cool new letter combination, and you think that this will solve all your problems and you want to use it straight away in your project. But new and cool doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right choice. And I, and I advise you to all like try to sit down and think about which problems to solve and take it from there. And I think a good thing here can be to fire up a small toy project and take it for a spin first and see if it works for you. And in my experience, we can build good and bad applications regardless of which architecture we use. Cool, so now that we have some understanding of some good subjective architecture principles, let's dig a bit deeper into a specific architecture commonly used in Swift UI applications. Uh, 
Right, so MVM, which stands for model or MVMC, which stands for model view view model coordinator. So uh, MVM is a pretty popular pattern that you might have heard of before. And it's uh, aiming to separate the development development of the user interface from our model code in a simple way. And it gained some popularity in the iOS community to battle a common problem called massive view controllers. So now you're all asking, what's a massive view controller? Uh, so like before the Swift UI days, uh, UI, now when we had the UI kits to our disposals, Apple promoted another pattern called MVC, uh, which stands for Model View Controller. So each view here would be owned by a view controller and the controller would update the model and the model would notify the controller and the controller would update the view. Uh, what would happen here is that we would stuff a lot of model code in our view controller like this. So here we have uh, two examples. We load an image here and we use a system library URL session that Philip talked about before. And we use that to fetch an image. And we also have some database operations here. We use a third party library called Realm to save a user. Uh, and we haven't really here encapsulated the use of these system libraries and third party frameworks. And this is bad for multiple reasons. We made this really hard or more or less impossible to test since we don't own or can see the source code for this. We don't have an understanding of how things works and we can't really control it, which makes it very unpredictable when we're writing tests. And as I mentioned before, we also spread out our model code here all over UIKit. So we have a tight couple, coupled code here between UIKit and, for instance, URL session and Realm. So this makes it super difficult to, to migrate later if we want to use Swift UI, for instance. So to save the day here, and iOS developers started to use MVM instead without thinking too much about it. But if we're not careful here, we will end up with the same problem. We just moved our code to somewhere else, basically. Uh, right, so back to MVM. Uh, next up is our view model here. And this is the sort of equivalent to the view controller that we saw before and this acts like a bridge between our view and our model and we expose bindings here that our view can use to update its state uh, but as i said we can easily end up with the same issue here we just moved it somewhere else so how do we actually address this we do this by abstracting our way our dependencies like this so in this case we use services instead so i created one image service and a database service so now we have a layer between the third party dependency and the system library that we can control so we can for instance if we write tests we can swap out what the image function actually does we don't have to we don't have to make an actual URL request. We can just mock the data and same for the create user function here. Uh, so, and we also shared some clarity here to what dependencies this particular component actually depends on, which wasn't very clear before. Right, so next up in the MVMC, we have the model. So what goes into this? It's things like services and controllers and repositories, local storage and JSON models. Uh, then we have the view, which should be lightweight and stupid. And as you see now, it shouldn't really consist of any model code whatsoever. Um, this is also because if we want to 
right now we have Swift UI, but who knows what happens in the future? It might be that we, in five or 10 years, Apple will release something new and we want to be able to use that as well. Uh, next up, we have the coordinator, which we haven't really touched on yet. So this is not uh, traditionally part of the MVVM pattern, but it serves like a nice way to handle navigation and preparing our model for the view model. So the coordinators are also like a great way to encapsulate a particular flow. So a good example of this would be if we have a, like a sign up flow or a login flow that we want might want to present in multiple places in our app. Here we have a very comprehensive overview of how each component reference each other. And we have a cross reference here between coordinate and view model. And to not have a retain cycle here, we have a weak reference to the coordinator from the view model. Uh, Sweet, so enough with this theory and let's actually build something. So this is what we're building today. This is our pizza as a service app. So in this application, we can make pizza orders and we can proceed to a checkout screen. And we have a bunch of state here that needs to be synchronized between the views. We can we can delete our pizzas and we can uh, we can add and remove stuff and it should all be in sync no matter what we do and we also get some nice built-in stuff here from swift ui such as uh, swipe to delete and animations uh, but before that exploratory topic uh, so i can uh, recommend you guys to look up Combine. Combine is a powerful reactive framework in Swift for processing values over time. With tons of useful operators, Combine enables us to construct and customize pipelines for asynchronous events. And this application that I'm about to show you, the code here, uh, uses some Combine as well. So we will see that in action very soon. But uh, let's start off by looking at some code and how this app is built uh, by going into the entry point of it. So this is the first thing that happens in the application lifecycle, which is basically some setup for our coordinator to get started. And we have two references here on line three and four. The first one is a window, and the window here is a built-in component from UIKit. And it works sort of as a backdrop for our app's user interface. And we also have another reference here, which is a coordinator of type pizza order coordinator. Uh, and the first component we're going to look a bit more in detail of is the uh, pizza order controller here that's created on line 12. Uh, right, so our pizza order controller is responsible for mapping our pizzas to something we can use in our UI. So we can see in our controller as something that thinks about our model and operates over it. And this controller is also used to synchronize the state for multiple views. So this is something that our view models will uh, use as well. They will have a reference to this. So they, they also like get the latest state always. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, we can have a look at the setup subscription function here. And here we actually see some combine in action. Uh, first, we retrieve our pizzas from our repository. And then we use a combined operator called compact map. And this is more or less like a map, but we can 
but it returns uh, only null, non nil values. So we need this because the currency for, for, uh, conversion here can fail. Uh, we then return a pizza menu item, and I will get back to this very soon. And then we assign this stream to our own property called all pizzas here. Uh, right. So we also have this published property here. And this is another property wrapper. So uh, Philip mentioned this as well, but the published property can be thought of as an automatic broadcaster for anyone listening. So this is what our view models will listen for. Uh, next up, we look at the pizza repository. Uh, so we have one property here, which is a closure that returns a publisher with uh, generic constraints of an array of pizzas. But that essentially means that we, we have a stream of something that will return us an array of pizza. And the never thing here is that we specify that this can never fail. In a real life scenario, that's probably not true, but for the simplicity of this, it can never fail. Uh, we also have an extension here, and we uh, use a mock here. And this is also to keep sort of like the scope down for this tutorial, but in real life, we will probably hit up the internet for the data or something. Uh, next up is our actual data model. Uh, and here we can see something called identifiable which is a protocol or an interface in Java. And this is a, like a requirement in Swift UI so that it can perform diffing for state updates. So when we tap a pizza, for instance, and we see the check mark, it performs a diff. And that's possible by doing this. And we have one single requirement for that, and that's the ID property. So this uh, needs to be unique. Uh, and here we have some mocks. So this is what we're using in the app. We simply define an array and we create a bunch of pizzas. So this will be our menu in the application. Uh, right, so let's go back to our controller. So as I said before, uh, after compact map, we uh, return this pizza menu item. And here is another good practice is that we, it's usually good to use different data models for different contexts. So previously we saw the pizza data model, but we have another model here and we do that because it gives us much more flexibility. So our UI, for instance, want to present a string here for the price, but we want to keep our price as a number for later so we can calculate the total price for our pizza order. So back to our entry point, we now have everything we need to set up our coordinator and start the ordering flow. So here in our start function, we create our view model and we inject it with the controller we just looked at. We then set the coordinator here to ourselves, And then we create our Swift UI view and we pass it the view model. And then we opt out to UIKit. Remember that said we can, we can mix these like we want. Uh, so this is how we can wrap our Swift UI view inside UIKit, basically. So we do this, we, we can actually do all of this in Swift UI, but like one of the pain points and frustration in Swift UI has been navigation. So by doing this, we can keep the navigation in UIKit and we can render our views using Swift UI. So we then do some uh, configuration of our navigation controller. And the navigation controller here is the classic, you know, push pop 
swipe back thing that we have in iOS. And then we just assign it to the root here for our window. Uh, right, so next up is our view, which looks like this. So here we can see that we reference the view model on line three. Then here we have another property wrapper called observe object. And this is what's sort of the magic behind Swift UI that this by having an observe, observe object, we can automatically get updates for any given state. Uh, so, and inside our body block here, we wrap everything in a C stack. And that's because we want the checkout view to be on top of the list, basically. Uh, and then we have our list here that presents our menu. And we construct different sections here, depending on the pizza type. Uh, and we also here have some like logic that we pass to the view model. So this shouldn't be anything that the view try to solve, but it passes the message to the view model and the view model will update the state and the view will render again, more or less. Uh, cool. Next up, we have our small menu items view here. So like similar to how React likes to think about this, we should leverage view composition and make small components that we can reuse. And here we don't reference the view model. We should just like pass it data for, and we do that for a couple of reasons. It makes it much easier if we want to mock this, for instance. So if we use Xcode previews, we can just pass it two strings in a Boolean instead of a view model. And we also like this gives us the opportunity to use this in other contexts as well that might not depend on the actual view model. Uh, so last but not least, this is how our checkout view looks. Uh, and here we uh, have uh, of this stack and we do some some configuration here to to make it look like it should uh, and we can also see here we can we can for instance customize different things so here we have on line 13 we can have a text property and we can specify it in bold and we can concatenate that with another text that's not bold for instance uh, and we also have a uh, closure here on line three. So this is when we press the checkout button here and that message will be sent to the view model. Uh, and this is how our view model looks like. And for the sake of brute here, I'm only showing parts of it, but the full example will uh, be available for you guys later, as Philip mentioned before. So here we use a similar approach as we saw before in the pizza order controller. We have a setup subscription function. And here we reference the controller's published properties and we can operate over those. So the controller here has two properties that we want to use. So the first one is the all pizzas. And as you remember before, this will be a type of pizza menu item. And here we want to map over these and we want to create our different sections. And then we do this same thing here. We, we assign it to our own property. And this is what the view listens for. And then here we have the total price and we can have some lo logic that we can check if the price is nil or not. And if it's nil, we, we hide the checkout view more or less. And right, and we also have uh, these cancelable things here. And this is just to store a reference to the 
published signal. If we don't do this, it will uh, it will not uh, stay alive, basically. Uh, so next up, we go for full circle here, and we go back to our menu view here. And here we can see the actual properties that we observed here. Uh, nice, nice. Next up is the checkout screen. So how does this screen gets presented? So we're going to jump into our coordinator. And this function here on line six did present checkout will be called when we press the checkout button. So, and pretty similar to how we set up the, uh, the ordering screen, we create our, our view model, which is a different type here. And we set our coordinator to self. We create the view, we wrap it, the view inside a UI hosting controller using UI kit. We set the title and then we push it on the navigation stack. Uh, then we have our checkout view that looks like this. And here we can note that on line 12, for instance, here we see on delete. So this is really all we need to have the swipe to deletion thing, which is pretty neat. So that's that's like one good thing about Swift UI. You get so much of these things for free. Uh, saying that it can also be a bit frustrating because it yeah, like you have to play along with the system. Like if you want to do something more custom, you can end up with some problems. Uh, and right here we have uh, some logic in the body function, body property here. So first we check if the count of the order pizzas is bigger than zero, then we show this list, right? So otherwise, if it's empty, we show a uh, empty state here. And we also base this on the actual visibility of the button. Uh, and next up, we have the pizza order checkout view model. So this is what drives our checkout screen. Uh, and here we can see that we use the same approach as you've seen before. We uh, define a setup subscription function and we operate over the controllers uh, properties and we can fine tune and tweak that to serve our views need. So for instance, here we, we uh, have a total press here uh, observation, and but we don't have to hide this as we saw before, we can just uh, return a string here. So we can, depending on, on our needs, we can customize it uh, like this. And here we also see, can see a small example how we uh, communicate back to our controller. So for instance, when we remove an order pizza here, or in the case of the empty state, there will be a button that says, take you back to menu. And this gets called here. And the coordinator basically pops the stack. Right, so. To summarize this, Swift UI is multi platform. It works for Mac OS, iOS, Watch OS, and TV OS. We can use live previews to tweak our layout without recompiling. We can mix Swift UI and UI Kit seamlessly. An app architecture should work as a shared knowledge within your team. In any given architecture, make sure to decouple your business logic from the UI. Right, any questions? 
No, it's pretty pretty calm on that uh, part actually. Uh, probably now when it's getting a little bit more complicated, it's it's uh, a bit harder to grasp maybe. Uh, yeah. So, um, I mean, uh, it's 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 kind of nice to be able to 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 work with this uh, UI on so many not platforms but but different devices as 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 you said uh, do you think there will be i mean since the the swift language is open source do you think there will be an incentive to to make the swift ui uh, go in that direction to to be used on, on other systems or is it very hard bundled with with ios I would say it's really hard bundled to the Apple ecosystem. Uh, saying that, I mean, like, as we saw, we're using UIKit for iOS on the hood. And on macOS, we use AppKit. So that's an um, implementation detail. So that could potentially mean that we could have something for Windows as well, right? Mm. So, but uh, I don't think it's likely no, if we no. say it mm. like that. Um, getting a question from David, if we have a multi-platform app, do we need media queries in the same code base or are they separated? Uh, what do you mean by media queries? Then we have probably a lag of 10 seconds. So, so, and David <laughs> to, <laughs> to write a response to that. Uh, we'll see if that drops in. Wondering if media queries, the only media queries I can think of is CSS media queries, but. So what's a CSS media query then? Uh, it's to, to be able to query different medias like printers and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's probably like that. Like if we can set, uh, if watch OS show this. All ah, right. Yeah, uh, that's possible and unfortunately necessary as well. Sometimes, yeah, because like we have, it's the, the, the sort of thinking about behind Swift UI is that we have like these different components and they should all exist on all platforms and so forth, but they don't really do. So it doesn't always, always make sense. And uh, I mean, different platforms have uh, different characteristics and stuff like that. Uh, thank you so much, Johan, for participating. Uh, thank you. Uh, hope to see you. I mean, it would be interesting to, to, to have you on as a guest lecture in one of our architecture courses, I, I guess, uh, where uh, this would be a hot topic. I know uh, the, the yeah. different uh, architectural patterns are highly discussed if you are using MV, whatever, or so so there is a lot of discussion going on there definitely uh, thank you so much Johan. gave you one a big applause in the chat and uh, we will have a, a short recess uh, back at 11 with the android parts so thank you once again
And we're back. I forgot to unmute. Welcome, Jonas. Uh, we continue the mobile development track for today, but we switch platform, right? Yes, that's right. Let's. We are switching to Android. Uh, thank you very much for for having me and having us. Uh, so uh, I'm delighted to. Uh, speak to you about uh, Android platform and developing apps for Android. I will also try to, to feel as much as possible about this subject in this uh, coming 40 minutes. So uh, here we go. Uh, shortly about the agenda that I have, uh, just going to talk about myself, uh, the Android OS, a bit of history, architecture, and then we'll jump into the fun stuff with programming. Uh, let's look on the Java and Kotlin languages and compare them. Uh, and then some on developing Android apps, uh, the UI and distribution of, of our apps. Uh, shortly about me, uh, so Jonas Hansen is my name uh, and uh, background in uh, Master Science, Computer Science in Lund. Uh, been working with Android for uh, around eight years at least, uh, been at Pontouch since 2018. Uh, and today I'm working with the Swish team, uh, where we have, of course, the private app that I guess most of you are using uh, or have seen. Uh, we also have a business app that is a bit similar, but used for, for businesses. Uh, and I'm also a manager within uh, the Google competence area that I will talk about a bit also. Um, so shortly about Bontouch, uh, Philip talked about uh, a bit about also what we do. I'll, I can just give a short summary about what Bontouch is and do. So we have uh, lots of the many of the, the, the most, uh, the biggest brand in Sweden that you probably heard of. Uh, Swish, as mentioned, uh, Postnord, SB, SJ, Systembolaget, and so on. We uh, we don't uh, we develop apps for those, those uh, and not really as a consultancy, but we do it in house uh, and provide all the competences needed to build an app with developers, testers, design, and so so on. And we have offices in um, uh, Stockholm uh, and also Öre, Östersund, uh, Kalmar, and abroad in London and New York. And uh, I'm just gonna give you a small um, feeling of how it is to, to work as a developer at Bontouch. Uh, so basically we have different teams uh, for, uh, that makes uh, for each app more or less, uh, where developers are spread out in and together with other competences such as design and test and team lead. Uh, but we also have something called a competence area, which is a, uh, kind of uh, a group that uh, organizes uh, people for each competence, like Android, iOS, design, test, and so forth, gather around and speak and share uh, uh, lots of experiences and uh, knowledge with each other to make sure that we're on track on the latest stuff and what we work with. We And that we do with, uh, weekly but also we have some some events uh, every year um, weekly have a, have a classic fika where we just talk about random stuff or what we do or a subject we do as maybe a cool a competence development lunch where we uh, take turns and speaking about a bit more on a subject for each other and code camps where we gather around a few years times a year and uh, try out the latest and greatest within our, our area. Uh, and also back in the good old days where we could go to conferences, we also used to do that. Uh, mainly the biggest one, Google I.O. and WWDC in California. Also uh, smaller stuff like Kotlin Conf and other in Europe. So we'll, we'll hope that will be possible again uh, soon. So let's jump into looking on the, the Android OS. Um, and um, I just want to give, start by giving you a brief uh, history of Android, uh, which started out in 20, 2007 when the first beta came out. Uh, and in 2008, we have a first version 1.0, which was 
the first device was uh, available in the market called T-Mobile D1. Uh, quite simple, but yet uh, uh, there was quite a few features that were, were quite nice. Uh, you had touchscreen, uh, built-in keyboard, and also a, um, a kind of track ball, uh, because back in then it was also quite common to navigate mobile UIs using track balls or Sen tracking sensors uh, to highlight components that you click instead of just touching the screen. Um, in 2009, the first publicly available version came out called Cupcake, and this is also when a wide array of other phone vendors could start using Android, adopting it for their devices. And uh, since then, quite a few versions were named by a dessert, so to say, uh, with uh, Donut, Eclair, KitKat, Marshmallow, and so on for each like major version of Android. But then they dropped this uh, quirky version names in Android after 9, which was Pi. And after that, it's just the Android and the number of the version. 2011, we have support for tablets. So uh, that was quite a big milestone. In 2014, we had Android 5, uh, also named uh, Lollipop. We introduced Material Design. And Material Design is Google's kind of design language, the, the recommended look and feel of how apps should, should look like. And there are quite a few uh, existing components that you can use that kind of adopts to material design that uh, makes it easier for you to, to build apps that adhere to this. And 2017 was uh, quite a big year uh, and the exciting announcement that uh, from Google that Kotlin was announced as the official language for Android. So up until then, then Java has been the official language, but it, the Java support has been lacking behind a bit. Um, we have been able to use newer features of Java and then Kotlin, a very nice and modern language came and is today used in the majority of all apps uh, for sure. Uh, and in 2021, this year, uh, Compose, our new uh, cool UI framework became stable and uh, is quite mature for production. So also very exciting uh, to start using this. And we have also started looking at in, in OneTouch. Uh, and Android is a quite uh, being open source. It's uh, very uh, nice. Um, it can be adopted in, in quite different ways, both run on different devices, but also apps can be have UI adopted for different uh, device factors. Uh, we have cars, uh, which is called Android Auto. Uh, so you can make a, like a car adopted UI in your app that shows when you connect your phone. We have Android TV, which is a standalone version of Android that can be uh, running on like smart TVs and dongles. And uh, quite a few TV vendors, they have Android TV as like their default smart TV UI. So you can use Android apps and everything. Uh, we have for smartwatches, which is called Wear OS. Uh, it's not as big as a, a Apple Watch, but um, Google is trying to, to lift it also. Uh, there's Chrome OS, which is a lightweight uh, operating system running on laptops, and it also runs at the uh, Android apps, and you can download anything from Google Play there. Uh, but there's also other vendors that uh, adopts Android and makes like a fork of it. Uh, for example, Amazon, which has uh, their own fork of the Android, which they call Fire OS, that is running on their tablets and TV dongles. Uh, and also Windows 11, uh, interestingly enough, has uh, is going to get support for Android apps. Uh, and those are, will be distributed through Amazon's App Store also. So you can have different app stores, not only Google Play. Um, so that's also one uh, benefit of this openness in Android. Uh, a big quick look on the architecture of Android. Uh, it's built on Linux, uh, it's built on a slightly modified Linux kernel uh, for the purpose of the constraints of mobile devices. As I said, open sourced through AOSP, Android Open Source Project. So anyone can 
contribute to the operating system. Um, there's also what I will uh, show you later, the Jackpack libraries for building apps. They're also open sourced. Uh, while Google's own apps that you're probably familiar with, Gmail, Calendar, Messages, those are closed proprietary products uh, that only vendors that has like a license for, for, for Google Play and so they can come with those pre-installed. Um, and the apps themselves run on the, the, something called the Android runtime, which is JVM based. Uh, so all apps are compiled down to, to Java bytecode, uh, basically, uh, which is uh, run on this. Uh, just a quick uh, overlook on, on how the, the, our, the operating system is layered. It's, uh, you don't have to uh, dig more into this, but as you can see, there is, as I said, in the bottom, the Linux kernel uh, abstraction layers where vendors, they adopt their hardware to, to the APIs of uh, that the Android system and apps understand. And then you have some Java API frameworks that apps talk with uh, to give notifications and talk to other system services. So, um, so if you look on the, oper the languages that we write apps in, uh, as I said, uh, up until a few years, Java was the standard. Um, and I can tell you, give you a short brief on why we have uh, left uh, Java behind us since um, the most uh, recent or older Android versions quite limited to the feature set of Java, actually Java 7, which is really old uh, nowadays. The latest version is Java uh, 17, I think. This is because of, we can say, a kind of license disputes <laughs> between Google and Oracle. Uh, so the feature set has been lacking behind. Uh, Google has been able to add more features from Java in recent Android versions, but uh, you most of the time you want to support older Android versions as well in your apps. So for that, they have added something called uh, API desugaring, which is basically that you can use newer Java features in your apps, but the compiler rewrites them into a bytecode of a like Java 7 version, but older Androids uh, exist. But it's still a limited set of the features. So uh, thus, it's really nice that we have Kotlin today. Uh, and Kotlin, uh, briefly, I can say it's a strongly typed language, compiled language also. So it's compiled to, to bytecode, um, developed by JetBrains. So JetBrains is a company that also develops Android Studio, uh, the, our IDE, and also I, um, IntelliJ and lots of other IDEs that's quite common for other languages and platforms for like web development and C++ and, and such. So they make quite a few tools for, for development. Uh, it has uh, first class function types, which makes it a powerful language for functional programming. Uh, those are expressed with Lambda expressions, and this is uh, also enables for uh, imperative programming that Compose is using. So I will show you more on that uh, soon also. Um, the syntax is quite similar to Java, uh, but also more modern, more uh, concise and, and compact. Uh, and many shortcomings of Java uh, is fixed and, and in, in Kotlin, so I'd say. Uh, what's also really cool with Kotlin is that it can be compiled for other platforms uh, using something called Kotlin multi-platform. So you can actually set up projects where using Kotlin code, you can build like binaries and, and apps for, for example, C, C++ uh, that is run on natively on Windows or Linux or whatever. You can compile it down to JavaScript uh, and even to iOS. Uh, it has definitely some some limitations. Uh, so you, but you can uh, still use like a, a one Kotlin code base that is used by both Android and iOS, usually for more like lower level business logic and data classes. Uh, so um, it's more there where it's used, and we are researching a bit on using this at OneTouch as well. 
uh, and yes, as I said, it's open sourced and anyone can also contribute to features to Kotlin. Uh, just a quick uh, brief on like the highlights of Kotlin, uh, the null safety, uh, like optionals, as you heard also uh, Philip talked about uh, in the type system, which makes your apps more stable and avoiding null crashes. Uh, extension functions, uh, default arguments, range expressions for comparing uh, if something is within a range or so. Uh, operator overloading, you can also see that in non languages uh, such as uh, C++. Uh, and data classes, which I will also show you a bit of. Uh, and coroutines for, for asynchronous uh, tasks. So let's look into a bit how Kotlin performs versus Java. Uh, I know that some of you have uh, have already studied a bit of Java, so you might be a bit familiar with uh, the, the ups and downs with it. Uh, and for JavaScript, might be a bit the syntax is might be a bit similar as well. So here to the left, I have a, a simple function in Java that prints an amount. Um, uh, or it, it, it kind of formats, given an amount and a currency, it prints like the amount with a currency after it. Uh, but maybe we uh, want to have some default behavior if currency is null, because in, in Java, anything can be null or at least uh, object references. Uh, and when I use this, then I have to pass something to this currency argument each time. So if I pass null, then it prints sec, uh, and if I pass like, Knock, Norwegian kroners, it prints that. Uh, but it looks a bit um, tedious to, to have this if currency null and such. So with Kotlin, it's more, um, there's more concise use of this through uh, optionals, nullables, as we call it. So if you see the, the currency argument now is a uh, op uh, nullable with these question marks, uh, meaning that now it can be null, but we also must handle the cases where it is null. So what I do now is that I can uh, get the real currency by checking uh, if it is null or not with this nice Elvis operator, as we call it, which is this question mark colon in the middle. And this is quite powerful, which basically says that to the if the expression to the to the left is not null then use that otherwise use the one to the right for those of you who use java it kind of is a bit similar to the tertiary expressions that you use as a simplification of if else but this is for for null types instead uh, and in kotlin you use like you always use like if for um, those situations uh, one nice thing with uh, Kotlin is what we call string interpolation. So in Java, as you can see, you have to like append a empty space uh, after amount and then the currency. But in Kotlin, you can just use the uh, amount and real currency uh, vals directly in the string. Uh, so it's much more simpler. And then when you, oops. I was a bit too quick. <laughs> so uh, to, to wrap up this in, in main, now you don't have to provide an argument to this currency since you have a default argument, which is null. So if you just provide 133 in print amount, you could just print with sec, or you can give an uh, uh, argument with the currency. Uh, OK, let's jump. Uh, so some some other uh, interesting things in Kotlin, if we um, uh, like how we create classes compared to Java, it's uh, a bit simple also to provide uh, fields uh, and class parameters that you can this you declare directly in the class signature. So as you see here, I have something a simple example where you have a car factory which uh, has. Uh, some class fields, car to produce, and workers. And uh, by doing this, I it, they become fields and the constructor parameters. Uh, so I don't have to declare them in any other place. And in Kotlin, we also have something called the init block, which is called when this uh, object is uh, created. So if I want to do something uh, directly when um, 
when the class is created, then I just do it in init work. Here, for example, I uh, do prepare work. You can also see that here I have this nice, it's a, actually an extension method the, for each. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, the for each uh, on, on the workers list, which then basically iterates through each worker and then do some operation on it. And then it's called it. So the it there dot prepare for work is the that's each object in this list that you do something in. Um, and if we look a bit on how you can also use this with uh, optional values uh, in this car class, you can see that I have uh, a nullable uh, brake horse powers, which is set to null. So I can actually create an instance of this data class and uh, without providing a uh, value to this. Uh, so let's see here. And also uh, what's nice with this is that the data class creates, if you're used to Java, uh, then if you create something similar, you have to objects that you want to like compare or print the contents of, you have to implement your methods of this. Uh, which, which is called equals hash code and two string. But Kotlin is quite powerful with this. So in the data classes, they implement this implicitly. You get this for free. So if I do a print ln on this uh, car object, um, then I immediately get a nice string representation of it. Uh, we can, there's also something, a nice copy method on, on the classes which basically is um, does a deep copy of all the members of the class, but where you can like uh, modify one or more fields by doing this. So I had my car, which was a Volvo, but maybe I want to make a copy of this and just change the model to a V40 instead, uh, and maybe change the weight also. So then I just do a copy of the previous Volvo, uh, which was another model, uh, and just change that. And I don't know the horsepower with this. So I just set this to null and print it, and uh, we get a nice strong representation of that. Um, and the con uh, coroutines. So uh, to, I mean, in apps, of course, uh, Usually you have lots of, many apps do networking requests. So you want to, to make those requests in a safe way in a separate thread to not block the UI thread. So in, Co in Kotlin, we have something called coroutines, which is a built in um, system for uh, uh, expressing asynchronous tasks uh, in a way that looks like you're just calling methods. Uh, which is very powerful, and it's been there from from quite some time. Uh, so it's kind of standard since some time to use this. Uh, you can say it's a instance of a suspendable computation, um, uh, which basically is a function that do, does some work in the background. Uh, you can compare it to a thread in the sense that it takes a block of code and executes it in a separate context. Um, but a coroutines, they don't, each coroutine, they don't create action, an actual thread. So we call them something, uh, it's something called a lightweight thread because uh, the, the system can then make sure that whatever threads is uh, available, they take turn in, in running the coroutines. Uh, and uh, to, and also what's quite important when you do this asynchronous work is like maybe canceling it when, when that's required, especially for, for apps, you have UI that sometimes you navigate away from, or you close the app or something like that. And then you want to cancel like an ongoing network request and that you can orchestrate to a scope. So all coroutines is uh, belong to a scope. Um, and, uh, Usually you use a scope that is provided by, by the OS for you, which is canceled at the right moment when the UI is, is closed or so. Then we have something called flow, um, which is a synchronous stream. Uh, I will show you a bit how that is used in reuse view models. So here you can 
uh, collect a stream of data. So it's a, you can call it a thread that uh, emits multiple values and then someone listens to this um, and, and react, maybe show some, some UI or other ways react to, to the emitted values. And that's when you use flow, which is kind of a part of the coroutines framework. So if we look on our coroutines, uh, a simple first coroutine, we need, as I said, a scope. So uh, a very, if you a very simple app that, or more command line app, I would say it would be. Uh, you can call something run blocking, which creates a scope, and within the scope you call launch, and within this launch block then. Um, what's done here? Here is where you call your suspending functions. And when they are called, then uh, they're uh, like the contents within the launch block is moved to the background. Uh, and execution from can continue. So if you see that run blocking, um, basically what happens here is that you launch a coroutine, uh, something is delayed for one second, and after that second, it prints a uh, word, world. Uh, but what also happens is that uh, immediately after launch, the execution continues. So what happens here is actually that hello is printed first. Uh, and after this one second, the world is printed that had, was within the launch. But uh, as I said, run blocking, it kind of blocks the, the calling thread. So you can use this more for testing purposes. But in an app, you will use other uh, predefined scopes that it always gives you. Uh, okay, so let's dive into how uh, what you need to develop uh, your Android apps. What do you need? So it's a few things uh, to be just aware of. What you need an IDE, of course, uh, Android Studio. Uh, it's not required. Uh, it's not um, really like like for iOS, where it's kind of you have to more or less use Xcode to make your apps. Uh, you can just code in any text editor and compile and deploy to a device in command line. So that's also possible. Uh, but under Studio is nice. It gives you a lot of good features with refactoring and profiling and uh, previews of your UI and such. Uh, of course, in your code in Kotlin, um, and you need a Gradle script, which if you set up a project, it's automatically uh, a new project it, in Android Studio. It creates some basic Gradle files for you. But it's just good to be aware that uh, those is there. And in those files is where you configure mostly dependencies, uh, which you will need for Android for sure, because you have some third party libraries and such that you want to pull in as well. So that those you declare in the, in the Gradle scripts. Uh, and you have resources, which basically is a collection of everything bundled with the app that you might want to 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 display. Um, and uh, it can be strings, images, dimensions uh, for uh, and such. Uh, and of course, you need your UI, uh, which you build with either the old legacy XML uh, or more future proof, just uh, compose. And a quick look on Android Studio. Basically, this is how it looks. And this is actually running uh, Compose uh, stuff. And it has a nice preview, uh, profiling. And um, yeah, there's quite a few things in there. So what you need to start with when you create your app is an activity. So the activity is basically the entry point to all the apps. So every app will have at least one activity where you do something Maybe just show your simple UI or uh, more complex stuff, uh, navigation and so. So let's look like how, how that one can look. Uh, and here you can see that also we introduced something called a life cycle. So in, a, in, in all apps, more or less have a life cycle, which basically is uh, events that uh, happen when an app is created and ready to be drawn on the screen or put in the background, closed and so on and resumed uh, and uh, basically what you do is you just override one or many of those events so here we have something called on create 
which is a method which is called uh, by the system when the app is created or this activity is created. And already here you can set your UI uh, using, and here we have actually an example in Compose where you call set content and just do a simple text composable. And that's all you need to just print uh, hello world on uh, a simple activity. Um, so I will show more on the Compose later. Uh, yes, let's see. Yes, that's what set content. Um, and basically also a, a quick uh, overview on how kind of complex the uh, life cycle can be on, on activities. Um, uh, where you have this on resume, the activity goes to background and then back again. Usually you don't, for very simple apps, maybe you don't have to care that much, but um, uh, it's good to be aware of if you do more complex things, like if your app restart or so. Uh, okay, so let's dig into some, some more practical some things around this and fetch some cats, kind of similar to how Philip's uh, example uh, with the cat API that gives you uh, random uh, cat images. Uh, I will show you a simple example where you build up a view model uh, which uh, fetches the cats using uh, our most common network library and then uh, also has uses coroutines to keep a state of uh, loading and so on. For this, we will use the MBVM architecture, which uh, Sergey will talk a bit more about later also. Uh, but basically, the view observes a view model um, which then emits data whenever it's ready. The model itself uh, then requests data from the model, which has uh, fetches data from like the cloud or maybe a bundle database. The view model also holds a state representation of the UI, which is uh, can be very good to, in one place, keep track of uh, your state of the UI. Like, am I loading my, from my network? Am I showing something? Is there an error? And so on. Uh, a quick look on how this API looks like. This is like the JSON response for this API, where we have uh, some ID and a URL. And this we can use to create uh, an interface uh, using Retrofit. And Retrofit is a third-party library, actually, but it's more or less the de facto standard of how you fetch from network using Android. But it's not made by Google. It's made by uh, another company called Square. Um, but it's quite uh, straightforward how to use this. Uh, you declare an interface which describes how each endpoint you're fetching from looks like. Um, and this is here. It's the get uh, image. Uh, basically, you declare like the endpoint. So in this retrofit instance that I pass, already, I've already set here the base URL uh, for this. So here I just add the, the endpoint on top of this. And it also has uh, exp uh, exposes a suspending function, which is a coroutine, which uh, I can use to very easily fetch this from the background. Uh, and I have a data class, uh, which basically then retrofit uh, uses to, to convert from the JSON response into uh, an object that I can use uh, in my app. And the view model, uh, as I said, is a, it can be uh, actually doesn't have to inherit from this, but uh, when you uh, dig more into how view models is used in Android, it's quite powerful because it gives you some, um, uh, the system uh, gives you some good lifecycle uh, stuff that happens uh, with this. It provides a scope for the coroutines that is canceled when, when needed, so you don't have to keep track of this activity lifecycle and stuff. Uh, and what we want to do here is to add a state that represents uh, what's happening right now uh, when I fetch from my service. And for this, we use a sealed class. And sealed class is kind of a hierarchy of classes. You can compare it to like an abstract class or interface more or less, which makes sure that uh, when I check, uh, when I retrieve my, uh, when I collect or collect uh, the, the state from this view model, uh, I, I can I know what what different values it can inherit from. So it's only the the classes inside this sealed class that uh, it can uh, in, uh, inherit it. 
um, and it has a loading and error, which in turn actually contains some data, a throwable, which is uh, basically an exception with some information about went wrong, and uh, a success uh, value. And what I do here is I can actually add a mutable state flow, which is uh, it's a, a class that holds a state that can be easily read by, for example, an activity. And I'll create it. I use a default value, which is loading. So when the apps uh, start uh, collecting the state, they they get that it's loading and can show a loading screen. And when uh, my network is uh, loaded, then I just show maybe success or error. And for that, I use uh, this. So here, I actually in, I use this init block again to to as soon as the view model is created, I actually. Um, start fetching my cats just because, yeah, why not? And for this, I use this view model scope and um, I wrap it in a try catch uh, so that if there's something go that goes wrong, uh, when I do this uh, fetch cat from the service, it will uh, throw an exception which will then be wrapped in this loading state.error so the app doesn't crash itself or something if, if something goes wrong. Uh, and uh, Sagi will show you a bit more on how this is used uh, later on. So this is a bit on the view model. Um, so to basically what you need to build uh, or be aware of when you build your apps is the Jetpack libraries, which is like a suite. Uh, oh, sorry, now I'm jumping ahead of myself here. <laughs> uh, um, Basically, in the, the, the background of this is that uh, Android, as being a very open OS, uh, Google doesn't force the vendors to, to update to the latest version when a new Android version comes out. So there's quite a few users out there who has quite old versions, which doesn't have the latest uh, cool features. And for this, um, we have something called the Jetpack Suite, which is a collection of libraries that uh, contains um, everything you need to build apps um, uh, or components uh, for you for UI, for example, lists, database, camera, navigation, and so on. Uh, and there's often uh, you have to pull in uh, the the right library for those components. And for that, there is a homepage for this, which I will link to in the end of the presentation, uh, where you can find what's in this Jetpack uh, collection and also what uh, libraries, the dependencies you need to, to pull in. Uh, and it works for Android 5 and upwards, so which is quite old. So I think it's quite decent to support has that as lowest version. As I said, uh, there are some third party libraries that is outside Jetpack that can be good to know, uh, and it can be a, a, a a jungle to navigate what libraries should use for what. So we have some recommendations for, for example, fetching images that use something called Coil. It's also a third party library for fetching images. Uh, there's others called Picasso and Glide, which is common, but not the most advanced maybe. And as I said, the retrofit for fetching network. If you want to do more advanced video streaming, there's a, a Exo Player, which is a video player, which is Google makes, but it's also not bundled in Android. So in the building UI for uh, Android apps, um, I've said before that we have this XML, old, old way XML and the new that is Compose. We just take a quick look on this legacy system that we use today, the view system. Uh, basically, all the components in Android app, they must inherit from a view class, that, which decides on how they're rendered on the screen, more or less. Uh, you have text views, image views, buttons, and so on, quite common things. They are laid out in a view group, which uh, is a, a nested, it's a hierarchy of views, more or less. A view group also tells how, how they are laid out, like next to each other or relative to each other, and, and so on. Uh, yeah, linear layout and frame layout is some of those that lays out in a row. Constraint layout is more relative to each other. Um, and then you organize this in an XML file where you actually declare which views you want to use and how they're uh, laid out. Uh, and also what to give you a sense of what we're working with here is that uh, 
the this view.java is like around 15,000 lines of code nowadays and there's quite a few hundred public methods which makes it uh, a, a bit uh, tedious to navigate sometimes so th therefore it's it's going to be nice to leave this behind us soon and just a quick uh, look on how this can look like the xml we have a constraint layout um, and uh, uh, well, let's see here <clears throat> which lays out uh, views relatively to each other and so on. So it, it's quite good. Um, but we want to do something new and more modern. So therefore we're using, uh, we're slightly moving to Compose. And I know uh, in Johan's lecture, he also talked about imperative versus declarative and Compose is also a declarative UI framework. I can give you a short uh, just uh, feeling of or comparison to what that is. So imperative programming overall uh, is also what the view system follows. It describes how things should be done rather than what should be shown on the screen, for example. It's very bound around that every component has its own state uh, and that you manipulate to like set text or toggle visibility. So there's a lot of state for each component to keep track of. It also assumes that all those is available when the data arrives. So the data is not bound to the UI that you see on the screen and that can lead to some crashes if, for example, the system has cleared out uh, the UI before uh, when the data arrives. So declarative programming is focuses on the what, like what do you see, what should be rendered. Uh, and uh, it describes more the logic with the, about the control flow. So it doesn't describe like connect this button to this other thing. Like, uh, and it's more it the UI is drawn as reaction to a state, uh, which is very nice. So you get uh, the state uh, control when the state changes. That's basically when the UI changes. So there's uh, always just one thing you have to think of there. Um, and just a small recap on what, what you can do with Compose. It's everything is done in Kotlin. So now you don't have any XML files. You don't have to care about that. You do everything in, in code uh, and it's used function calls. Uh, you don't manipulate objects uh, like the views. Uh, and as I said, uh, it's when the data state changes that you draw the UI. Um, and that's also intended to replace this view XML in the long run. It's, it will probably takes, if you would like today, jump into any Android project, it will use views, of course, but uh, the interoperability is quite uh, good. So you can start using a Compose in like existing apps already today and kind of uh, mix it with the old views. So that's really powerful. So if you look on a first composable, uh, basically this is how it looks. All the, it's a function that emits UI uh, and it has this annotation composable. Uh, and here you just call this in, a, in an activity and it just draws the text on screen uh, in the set content. Uh, and um, you can say that uh, a, a nice slogan for how you work with Compose is that data flows down and events up. So meaning that like here in this greeting, um, if name, which is the data changes, then this text is uh, changed um, basically. And that's all that happens. Uh, so it, it controls the UI by just uh, updating name. So if you call this again with some other name, then only that text is changed. And that's all I have to think of. Uh, and events is the click. So here we have uh, like an on click. So someone could be interested in, this is a functional reference also. So this is kind of how you pass up events as uh, functional references. Uh, and uh, as you see here in this text button, they have this on click. So when, when uh, someone clicks a button, then this event is passed up by uh, calling this functional reference. Uh, a quickie on, on uh, how we distribute Android apps. Um, uh, you need to sign your binaries uh, with uh, a key that you obtain from Google Play uh, just to show that you are you, more or less. Uh, so it's good to know about this. Um, 
And the most common ways to deploy apps to distribute them, I would say, of course, Google Play, uh, set up a developer account, and you're good to go. There's something called Firebase, which is uh, used for testing, for sending out test builds to a more limited amount of users. But you can also just build as an APK file. So every time you compile an Android app, it's built as an Android, app, uh, Android APK file that you can distribute and install. So it's the, that should be more carefully used as an APK file, of course, to just send out to a limited amount of users. So if we wrap everything up, as I said, the fields like Android gives a lot of opportunities as being an open, uh, open system, like languages and deployment and such. But we have like a core recommendation on how we just do apps and distribute them. So you code with Kotlin, uh, our modern language. You build native UIs with Compose, and you will also hear more why native UIs in Android uh, is also the, the best way to, to build uh, the optimal app experience. And you distribute with Google Play um, to get most of your things. And yeah, as I said, I will send out some links and uh, in the presentation slides, so you see that they are here. And that's it. Uh, questions? Thank we have you, time. Jonas. Uh, you, you actually touched upon one of my questions, uh, and uh, when when I uh, uh, was deep diving into the the, the market of, of Android versus iOS uh, a long time ago, it was and, and you touched upon this. Uh, uh, the adoption rate on iOS is that was really high for the newest operating systems, uh, uh, but on on the Android side, it was. A lot harder and a lot of old um, uh, operating uh, or old versions out there. How, mm. how has it changed? Is it better now, or is it still a problem? Or uh, I would say it's uh, yeah. It, I haven't seen any statistics lately. If it has improved, I think it has improved, and Google is doing many efforts to improve it. Uh, they have launched a few initiatives to make it easier for for vendors to adopt. Because all vendors have to adopt uh, the Android version for their devices, like drivers and such. So Google is doing a lot of work. They are really keen on getting this better. So I, I, I'm quite sure it has became better, uh, but I don't have like a good numbers for it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, you can you can adopt your apps for like relatively high versions of Android today or recent versions. And I guess that is up to your customer to set the the boundaries for which. Uh, versions to to support or do you have internal rules for what OS is to support or? yeah you you can say that it's much to the customers and the user base it's quite easy to get statistics uh, on from like google analytics and so what android versions uh, the the distribution between Android versions for your users and take decisions on that we have, for example, for, for Swish, we have to move up, we have to drop Android 5 support because mm -hmm. Bank ID, they dropped Bank yeah. uh, Android 5 support. So now it's Android uh, 6 that is the lowest. So it's also sometimes the external uh, events that force you to, to move up. Yeah. Uh, this question came from Thomas uh, way before, so so maybe it's totally out of context, but Maven works as well, right? I don't know. I don't remember where in the topic it was. Yeah, it's on the, on the build script, and uh, I think so. It's, it Maven is the legacy build system. So uh, many years ago, that's the build system that, that you had for Android apps. So uh, Maven was the build system before, uh, but um, I'm not sure that it works today because Gradle is what's supported by Google, and Google makes like plugins for uh, building apps. Then, then those plugins are only made for Gradle today. So if you want to make apps that is uh, using the any newer features than for latest years, uh, then you have to use Gradle for sure, because Google don't support Maven themselves anymore. Perfect, uh, Jonas, a big thank you uh, for taking yeah. the time uh, to, to speak on this topic. Uh, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, and we will have a short recess for like 10 minutes and then we will deep even diver, uh, deep even deeper with Carlos and Sergey uh, on Android topics. So uh, be right back. <laughs>
Okay, we are back and I said that we should continue looking at Android, but we shall continue looking at something that is even dearer to my heart and that is cross-platform development and welcome Sergey and Carlo. Uh, I think you're both muted so that you know. Um, we are sitting in the same room, so we'll need to think how we unmute or unmute ourselves here, but yeah. we'll figure it out. Yeah. Probably. Uh, so uh, let's deep dive into this uh, topic uh, and I will leave it to you. Yeah. So Jonas was talking a bit about Android and uh, what uh, we wanted to dive in a bit more is like Jetpack Compose, how you can build a new UI in Android. So we'll just quickly go through it and we'll see some examples how, actually how you can do it and build that. But first of all, a bit, a bit about me. So I've uh, graduated from Ukrainian non, uh, not famous university at computer science and master science there. I've been a, a mobile developer at Bomb Touch for since 2019-ish, and I've been doing all the iOS, Android, and React Native at multiple projects at the same time in different timelines as well. But the agenda for the Compose part, which is still connected to Android for us, is that we'll see how we can start with the Compose We'll go through some of the basic air components and how you can do the layouts with them. And we'll see how you can apply different theme, themes as well to your Compose layouts. And there will be some useful links for you to learn about more about Compose in this case. So first of all, what is Compose? Compose is a declarative via framework by Google. And we've heard declarative several times today. And Jonas and Yuan were talking about that as well. So I think we can skip this part of the explanation of this word. Uh, and the stable version of Compose was released earlier this year, which means you can use the Compose in your production code. And as mentioned before, it is a part of Jetpack suite of all the libraries coming from Google in this case. And it is decoupled from operating system itself, which makes it easier to use even for the older OS versions, which is a big plus. How you can start with the Compose in this case? There are several ways. First of all, like in Android Studio, you can just create a new project and select empty Compose activity on the start screen. And it will help you to generate the template project with all the required dependencies which Compose needs so that you can start using Compose straight ahead. Or if you have an existing project, you can just add a bunch of dependencies to your Gradle file and all of them are listed on the developer Android uh, portal, and you can just take a look at them. This is just an example of what these dependencies might look like. Let's go a bit deeper to the Compose basics. So Compose uh, is built around composable functions. These functions let you define your app UI programmatically uh, by describing how it should look and providing data dependencies rather than focusing on process of the UI construction, like initializing an element or attaching it to a parent, etc. To create a composable function, you'll just simply need to add the annotation to the function name. Also, Android Studio allows you to have the preview instead of running that on an emulator or on a real device. You can just have the preview directly in, in the Android Studio. And let's see how it might, work, might, might look like in the code in this case. So here, for example, we have a greeting. Just as a classic example, we'll start with a hello world or hello name. And here you can declare your function, composable function, which will have one text component. And in the preview below, you can see that we have add previous annotation. And that's what we see on the right with just a message, hello, Android, uh, which is really helpful and neat so that you don't need to run it in your emulator. But what if you want to build something more complex in this case? Right now, we have just one text. For that, you most probably will want to use the layout which will allow you to combine different uh, composable functions and uh, elements in, in a different layouts. So let's take a look if, for example, we will add two different texts here. Now we have the same composable function, which will have two different texts. And let's see how it will look for us in UI. It doesn't look great because they are just lying on top of each other and Compose needs to be told how they should be laid out uh, compared like or, or relative to each other. And for that, what we can use is we can use different mul multiple UI components, group, uh, grouping uh, components, which amongst which we can see the column, which will allow you to arrange views in a vertical order, a row, which will allow you to arrange views in the horizontal order, or a box, 
which will allow you to play with them as different layers and put it on top or be behind each other. So let's see how it will look in the code. What we've done here, we've uh, wrapped both texts in a column so that they can lie in a vertical order. How it will look in UI for us? Kaboom, it is much better now. But we also can build some more complex UI and uh, we can use more columns and more walls at the same time. So let's take a look at that, what we can do with that. So for example, here, what we want to do is we want to also add a row so that we can have the picture of, of an actor here to the left of the text. And then we can still have the column inside this row. And it will look in UI like that. And it looks good, but it doesn't look perfect. Maybe we want to tweak something here and we want to add some paddings or resize the picture of the character of the actor, etc. For that, we can use the modifiers. And the modifiers allow you to change the composable size, the layout, the appearance, or add high level interactions with that, such as making an element clickable. And you can also change that, them to create richer composables. Uh, you, you can uh, also process the user input if you need that there and uh, react on that. And uh, important part here to know to have in mind is that the order of the modifiers matters so if you have double paddings you will need to think about that how to properly add them but let's take a look at how it will work in the code again so here we have on the right what was before that we want to tweak it a bit so first we will add some padding to the whole layout of the whole row for us so that we'll have eight uh, dps of the padding everywhere and then we want for example to set an image size to 40 40 and we want to change the shape of it so that it looks like a circle. And we'll add some more modifiers for the text as well. And when we apply all these changes, this a bit ugly layout on the right will turn to be like that. That is more nice, but it looks still a bit flat. What we can do about that? Uh, it's time now to talk about how we can add some theme into our application. So what is theming in this case? Jetpack Compose offers an implementation of material design, uh, and this is a comprehensive design system for creating digital interfaces for the Android. And the material design components like buttons, cards, switches, and uh, so on are built on top of material theming, which is a systematic way to customize material design to better reflect your product's brand. And when you have the generated project for you, you will see that the material there will be a material theme already added for you in your automatically generated project. And it will comprise the color, typography, and shape attributes, which can be applied for the whole application. And when you customize these attributes, your changes are automatically reflected in the components you use to build your app. So in our automatically generated new empty compose activity, what we'll see there, what we'll be, be able to find is that we will have the compose sandbox theme, or like this theme, whatever is your project is called, which will allow you to declare different palettes of the colors which can be used for dark theme or light theme, for example. Then you can also see that these are also automatically generated for you and I can extend it with even more different colors there for both dark and light. And all these like purple 200, purple 700, they are also declared and generated for you and you can easily switch and change them and use them later. So let's see how we can apply this theme in for our application. So in order to apply and use this theme, you will need to provide a, in a composable function on the root level, you will need to specify that you want to use your theme there. And you can do it like this here in your set content, or you can do it like this, that just declare that in your preview as well so that you can see that directly. Let's see how we can apply different rules for that. For example, that is our old layout and we want to apply something. For example, we want to add the border to our image. And we just simply add that as a modifier to our image class or image component. And we've added this width and color and shape of it and still it's circle. Voila, we got it right straight ahead there. Let's add some more customizations. For example, we want to change the color and style of the text of the actor name. And we can use our material theme colors and typography, which you can specify and change and alter if you need that. And we can see now it has been changed as well. And we can do the same even with more texts, like with the, with the character name as well. And that will look like that. That's all cool, but that's not it. As we have already prepared our light and dark mode, which is based on the theming in our color palettes, we can now get the dark mode support, just even in, even in preview. And 
to do that in a preview, you can simply add the small flag, which is UI mode, uh, which will force use the UI mode night. Yes. And without doing any changes in our layout, we'll just get it work out of the box and it will be a dark mode. But what if we want to show several actors in the list? Because that's more common case for us. First of all, let's prepare some data for that. And we'll just declare the data class, which will have the name, the character, and the drawable for the image. And we'll generate like five different actors here who are all off from the office. And then we can just simply, you, you might think that we can use column to show all of these actor cards uh, in the view. But the thing is that, uh, in case if you have if you don't have the the list size or you have quite a long list size, you might want to use the so-called lazy components like lazy column, lazy row, because they will allow you to support performance in a better way because they will be just loaded on demand in this case. And in order to have this as a list for us, we'll just simply add a lazy column where we will go through all the actors which we feed to our composable for the cast, and we will see it like that. Easy. But there are some things you need to be aware in Compose. All the composable functions, they can be executed in any order. They can also be executed in parallel. Recomposition or redrawing might skip as many fun composable functions and lambdas as possible to have a good performance. The recomposition, or again, redrawing, is so-called optimistic. So it may be canceled anytime also by the system. And a composable function might run quite frequently, as often as every frame of an animation. So you should not do any heavy calculations in your composable functions. More UI stuff to learn, which you might want to use, because these were just the basic components. You can read about constraint layout, which will it will allow you to uh, place composables relative to others on the screens. And it is an alternative to using multiple nested row, column, and other layout composables. Constraint layout also is useful when implementing larger layouts with more complicated alignment requirements there. You can also read about graphics, which allows you to draw custom graphics elements within so-called canvas. You can uh, learn about animations and how to apply them for the composable uh, functions and layouts. And you can uh, learn about how to handle gestures in your compose, uh, components. All these links are clickable, so you'll be able to just go through them as well. And even more deep stuff to learn about Compose is the life cycle of composables. Because if, for example, if a composable is already in the composition, so it is in UI and it's drawn, it can skip a composition if all the inputs are stable, so-called stable, and haven't changed. So that we will do the redrawing only when it's needed and when the app state has been changed. You can also read more about managing state in Compose and how you can actually control what you want to change or redraw in your UI based on this state and how you can connect the state of the app to the different UI layouts and components. And you can also read about so-called side effects of Compose. And side effects are so-called, it is a change to the state of the app that happens outside of the scope of the composable function. And there you can read how you can handle these different states as well there. And that was a quick go through the Compose. And I will thank you here. And if you have any questions, we can spare them till the end of the lecture. And now we will jump into cross-platform and React Native. Yes, uh, I hope we, you can hear me. You can hear me well. Uh, my name is Carlo. I'm a developer at One Touch, and um, I started to explore programming for Apple platforms when I was 14, and uh, eventually I learned about iOS development. Uh, later, I graduated from KTH and uh, then specialized in machine learning. Uh, now I work primarily with iOS and multi-platform technologies as part of the official app for the Post-it brand. And today, together with Sergey, I have the honor to talk to you about React Native. So let's take a look at our agenda. We'll talk about cross-platform technologies in general. Uh, we'll introduce React Native, uh, how you can do some troubleshooting and debugging, then why you would want to use such a technology and when it's appropriate to do so. And finally, we'll look at advantages and disadvantages. So let's get started. So we can divide the cross-platform universe into UI frameworks and low-level technologies, often low-level programming languages. Uh, you can use low-level technologies when you want to 
share business logic between different platforms. Uh, and I want to highlight Kotlin multi-platform here because I think it's particularly interesting and we use it at Bond Touch. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to share um, the UI, uh, then uh, it's even more powerful to use a UI a cross-platform framework. And there are many and with very, very different features, but the core idea is the same. You want to write the code only once uh, and then run your app on, dif on different platforms. And now in the case of Cordova and PhoneGap, uh, you are using web technologies like HTML and CSS. So the UX is not great. And uh, while if you use React Native, the cross-platform code is actually translated into native components. Uh, and the UI feels a lot closer to a native app. Uh, so a cool exploration topic to do on your own could be comparing these cross-platform frameworks. Now I apologize for the ugly chart, and I want to I don't want to bore you with uh, too much numbers, too many numbers. Uh, but this is just to show you that React Native is one of the most used technologies in this uh, realm. And if you look at its use in the App Store and Google Play Store, uh, these might look like small percentages. Uh, but if you consider that there are millions of apps out there, these percentages translate into thousands of developers that are choosing this technology. So what is it? Well, it is a JavaScript-based toolkit that allows you to write your code once and build mobile apps for Android and iOS that use native components. Uh, it is powered by the React framework, uh, but ultimately it uses UI, the native UI frameworks of the different platforms. So let's look at the history of React Native briefly. Uh, it started in 2013 uh, when uh, Facebook uh, introduced this project as a hackathon. Then in 2015, it was uh, released as a first public preview. And finally, later that the same year, it was available on GitHub for iOS. Later, they added Android support. And further down the line, even Windows and Tyson support. Um, now in 2018, the architecture is completely rewritten. And, uh, and with this, the support for uh, other platforms other than Android and iOS is also gone. So in 2019, then we have uh, more powerful uh, tools for debugging, like fre uh, fast refresh and logbox. So I said that uh, React Native uses the React framework, but how does it look? Well, if you're not familiar with React, uh, it, this might look really weird. It's a mix of JavaScript and HTML, and it's called uh, JSX. And uh, you can think of it as an extension of JavaScript. It allows you to build logic and UI in the same place, basically. React Native looks very similar. It still uses a concept similar to JSX, but you get access to uh, standard components that represent UI elements. In most cases, uh, you can also use the same technologies that uh, you're used to with uh, React.js, like Redux and Immutable JS and so on. Uh, and it, you can even use the same IDE that you're used to from web, web development. Uh, and in fact, they are similar enough, React.js and React Native, that uh, uh, if you already have a React.js web app, it might be worth looking into turning it into a mobile app with React Native. And this could be an interesting exploration topic on your own. So how does it work? Well. You start with your React component, in this case, a simple text label. And the component is then digested by uh, the JavaScript core library. And this is part of uh, Apple's iOS SDK. Uh, and it's also bundled with the, the React libraries on Android. And the core works in tandem with the bridge. And this is a set of uh, React libraries written in Java or C++, depending on the, on the platform. Uh, and eventually, this turns into uh, this turns the component into a native UI element uh, using the SDKs of the different platforms. So in this case, the this text becomes a UI label on iOS and Swift, and a text view on Android and Kotlin. 
So under the hood, uh, this means that events go through the core, the bridge, native code, and then back. And as with React.js, uh, UI updates are partial. So something called uh, shadow node takes care of resolving the layout. So uh, it only updates the native components in the view hierarchy that need to be updated. And as you probably already know, uh, JavaScript is single threaded. And this has deep consequences that aren't really there if you do native development instead. Uh, this means that the uh, React Native code is easy to understand. It is easy to understand data flows, uh, but it's also easy to overwhelm this one thread you have with lots of data or operations. Uh, this is actually a simplification uh, because React Native then uses different processes to, to handle the JavaScript core, native code calls, and so on. But you as a developer have only access to a single thread normally. Now, a cool consequence of using JavaScript is that JavaScript is just in time compiled. And uh, this means that most of our app's code can be completely dynamic and defined at runtime. Uh, we don't have the constraints of a compiled language. So you can modify your source code and inject it while your app runs on a mobile device. Uh, now, you might not want to do this in production, but it becomes super, super powerful uh, during development. It enables something called hot reloading or fast reloading, for instance. So I hope that you can see the video, but uh, you can change your source code, save, and then your app instantly refreshes, reflecting your latest changes. And if you're coming for web development, this might not be shocking to you. Uh, but if you have used the compile language before, this is basically black magic. And now let's look at how you would actually start a React Native project. Uh, you can use MPX, uh, which you have already installed if you've ever used Node before. And once you run this command, uh, it will generate a lot of code for you. And the most important parts here are the Android folder, where you will find native Android code, and the iOS folder, where you will find uh, native iOS code, and uh, finally, a file called app.js. Uh, now, um, if you open uh, a native, the native iOS project, for instance, you will see a lot of uh, Objective-C code that is not really relevant for us now. Uh, but you don't really need to understand it. The most important part here is this index.js file that the code points at. And the index.js file is really the entry point of our JavaScript code. And basically, everything beyond this can be completely shared between platforms. Uh, it's really simple. It basically just declares that uh, we have an app. And uh, the main component of this app is in is called app. And it's in the app.js file. And if we look at the app.js file, we see that this is where we actually define our view hierarchy. And we you know, we might define images and text and get access to system um, constants or system uh, state, like whether a dark mode is enabled or not. And uh, yeah, now I will hand it over to Sergey to talk about some troubleshooting techniques. Yep, and there we go. I'm back. So. Of course, you will need to troubleshoot it. It's, it is with all the development, you will need to know how to debug and how to proceed with the finding these bugs there and to be more productive in your development. Of course, React Native as, as well has plenty of tools for that. So first of all, we'll have the so-called dev menu, which will allow you to access all the debugging settings and all the debugging options in it. Also, we will have the log box. The log box is the tool which allows you to see the the crashes, not the crashes, but like any uh, any issues which are happening when you're doing the so-called fast refresh and you just do some typo and you want to see that on the screen. You will have some debugging tools as well, like Chrome debugging tools or Safari tools, which you can usually use with your or React or web development uh, debugging. We also have so-called React Native Inspector, which allows you to debug a bit of the UI stuff. And uh, in case if you will need to write some native uh, native code, 
There is also, you can just use either Android Studio debugging tools or Xcode debugging tools in order to debug your native code, which you also have uh, together with your React Native. So this dev menu, how does it look like? It looks like that. It has several options there, like reload. You can just do the reload of the whole UI and get all the fresh changes from what you have in your code base. You can debug with Chrome. You can show the inspector for the UI part. You can actually enable or disable fast refresh if you don't want to have it. You can have some configuration changes for the bundler change there as well. And you can see some performance of your app, like a simple performance of like how much of CPU you use, just memory, et cetera, just in the app as well. And you can access that in different ways. On device, you just usually shake it. Uh, on simulator, you can do the shake gesture. On Android emulator is command M uh, for Macs, for example. And of course, this menu is disabled in so-called production builds. When talking about DevTools, you can either use this option debug with Chrome, and you will just be able to use the Chrome uh, debug tools. You can also connect it to your Safari DevTools uh, and use that. That is easier, for example, for iOS simulator, and you can see all the structure of the UI uh, directly in the Safari as well. You can even install React DevTools via NPM and just hook it up so that you can use that. That's what you see on the screenshot on the right, and you can just also debug it there or you can connect it to any other custom JavaScript debugger. And usually it is fairly easy and React Native guides, they do provide that, uh, the instructions how to do that in a fairly simple way. The next very useful tool, which was mentioned twice already, is the logbox. So you can see on the left screenshot, it is the error, how it looked without logbox before on all the versions of React Native. And this is how it looks on the right right now when we do use logbox. So back in, like 20, when was it, 2019, it was lots of complaints about that it was hard to see where the, the issue actually was happening there uh, or where the problem is when you can see this big red screen with lots of stack trace and you cannot understand what's happening there. So it was decided that uh, React Native developers, they decided to make a, draw, a log box based on different um, complaints that errors and warnings were too verbose and poorly formatted uh, or unactionable by focusing on the three main primary goals, which are now the part of logbox. This is concise, which means that logs should provide the minimum amount of information necessary to debug an issue. It is being formatted as well, so that logs should be formatted so that you can quickly find the information you need and they should be actionable. So you will you should be able to fix to fix the issue and move on without digging into this tech trace because you can actually interact with the logbox and just go straight ahead to your code editor from the logbox to the specific file where the issue is. For the UI part, we have so-called React Native Inspector, which allows you to just tap on or click on any of the UI components and see some of the properties of it. It shows the information about the component. It allows you to jump directly to that component in the code as well. And it allows you to get some patterns and colors and text type, etc just there. So this was a bit of a debugging part, uh, which is useful, and we need that quite often. But you may also ask why, when, and when not to use React Native and to choose React Native. So let's talk about that. So why React Native? Why you might want to use React Native for your project? Because it is a single code base. You have it in JavaScript and React, uh, and you can just reuse that on multiple platforms. It is near to native experience because of all that bridging magic happening between JavaScript and native components. It builds reusable components into reusable native components, which then you can communicate with via this bridge. There is no need to learn new languages, kinda. We'll go further through that. And the biggest, if you compare that, for example, with another cross-platform, older solutions like hybrid apps or web apps based on Cordova and PhoneGap, it has no use of HTML and CSS. There is no DOM manipulation, which means the performance is much better. So when you can use the React Native, when you want to use React Native and you can choose it, it is the best, one of the best tools if you have the proof of concept and you just need to quickly try out and some, some of your ideas or like MVPs uh, and you want to launch the product for both platforms as early as possible. It is also applicable to the simple or quick projects for multiple platforms like mainly iOS and Android, but you can have more, you can add more, you can add support for more different platforms there as well. When there is an existing web app 
which can be converted to the React Native app with spending less time on rewriting all the code into Native, then React Native is quite suitable as well. Uh, and that belongs to the low or to medium complexity, which means that it's not heavy and it's fairly simple app. Or for example, if you have a limited budget and you want to cover both iOS and Android. But there are also cases when you should not use React Native. And amongst them can be, one of them can be that you have the focus group or the target group of your users, which are using only iOS or only Android. So there is no need to support both platforms or several platforms. So you'd rather go with native development in this case. Or you have the complex apps with heavy animations, screen transitions, and other design complexity. Because in this case, uh, even though React Native is using native components, but using heavy animations and these transitions can be tricky and may lead you to write them in a native code anyway. In typical cases, React Native is close to native when talking about performance. But if you have ultra high performance requirements for the app, it is better to go with a native because you might need to tweak that it's the performance of the app. And if you will need to do that because of the limitations of React Native and single threading, you will end up writing those tweaks in native part. And probably you just have started with the native part as well. And extensive processing and many background threads is not also an option for the React Native because again, it's a single threaded and communication between JavaScript and native code is done via bridge. So ultra high performance is not guaranteed. For example, you probably should not use React Native for any kind of games. Talking about pros and cons in this case, of course, they're both. Amongst pros, we have, again, the shared code base for both iOS and Android. So you need to write the main code or the, like, the, the main core code only in one language, and you will have support for both platforms. It is easy to start having JavaScript and uh, React Native knowledge. So if you have worked with JavaScript and React before, then you, it, it is easily uh, it is easy to start with the React Native development in this case. No need to learn other languages and need here is in quotes because we'll discuss it later. Fast refresh is neat. It is really helpful when you just quick click and apply some changes. You can see them straight ahead on your device or simulator or emulator. And it is community driven, which means that there is lots of different plugins and dependencies which are written by other developers and they are open source. But of course, there are cons as well there. Facebook rules there. So it has been created by Facebook and you, we might not see it now in the coming several years, but it might be a case that Facebook will decide that they will just sunset the whole React Native and it might be quite painful then to migrate your project which you have to some other tools. Scalability can be problematic. Uh, Airbnb had some, case, some issues with the scalability and they have uh, written a big article how they've tried to use React Native and how they sunset it that like a couple of years later because it just didn't work for them. React Native on Android is not as stable as on iOS. There is still some issues with Android support there. And even though you will need to learn, you will not need to learn several languages, there is still some aspects which you will need to know about native parts. For example, how to sign and release on App Store or Google Play or when adding native features like push notifications, et cetera. So you will need to write some native code in order to support that. And a bit more cons is debugging and crash reports can still be tricky, even though there are lots of troubleshooting tools, but you might still have some troubles and issues trying to catch some nasty bug there. And there are strong dependencies on dependencies, no pun intended, but because of all the NPM, the NPM is used as a dependency system there, and you might end up having hundreds of different dependencies which might not be compatible with each other. Because if you have one of the packages of an older version and another package has been released and it supports a new versions of, of some other package and there is sub dependencies, it also can be painful to fix that and to sync them all together. Sometimes there are also a lack of some custom modules, for example, some custom components. Of course, you can write your own as well, but it means that you will need to actually will need to write them if you don't find any suitable component. And of course, you can share that because it's community driven. And quite often, there is a delay in supporting the latest OS features, for example, iOS 15 and Android 13, 12, 13, I can't remember. Uh, they have been released recently and all the new features and uh, fancy stuff, which will be 
supported on native apps out of the box. It might come to React Native later, and sometimes it can take several weeks. Sometimes it can take several months because it's again it's community driven, and some one will need to write that code in order to support those features. And the last but not least is the migration to the newer React Native versions is not always smooth. So you cannot jump from version 0.60 to 0.65 without any issues. You might need to do the incremental updates to 61, then 62, then 63. So it can be quite time consuming process in this case. It has become better, but it's, there are still some issues there. And just to mention some big companies which actually have shared their stories of doing the React Native or migrating to React Native for their apps. The Aaron Baby had a hybrid solution of native plus React Native, which worked quite well for them, but because of the scalability issues, they had to sunset it in 2018 and go back to native. Uber Eats is also a good example where they had a web-based dash dashboard and they've just converted to the React Native app and it went smoothly for them. Shopify has a quite a big and good article about how they went all the way React Native for both iOS and Android. Discord, I didn't know about that, but they actually have rewritten their iOS app to the React Native, but they decided to stay native on Android because of the issues of React Native and Android altogether. And there are more, of course. There is Walmart, Pinterest, Bloomberg, and others. So you can read, I can also post the links about that and add them to this slide so that you can read all these articles there, which are quite interesting to understand how, how you can use that and when not to use and to see what are the pitfalls for the big companies. And just as a cherry on the cake, on top of the cake, uh, we decided to do some comparison of Swift UI Compose and React Native with a simple UI demo, because we've talked about these declarative frameworks for building UI. And what we'll see here, so we've built some simple UI, which is the post view with the several UI components. And uh, we can see the previews for the Swift UI here, how to look on Swift UI Compose in the previous for both. And for React Native, we actually were running the app on, on the simulator as well. So they look similar. And on the next slide, we can also see in the code samples how they might look like. And it will be a bit hard to read, but you will get the slides as well. So it's more about the comparison, how it looks like in Swift UI, and if it's easily readable or not for you, or for Compose, or for React Native. And just talking about the lines of code here, Swift UI was 39, Compose was 55, and React Native was 54. And that's because of different like uh, indentations in different codes and uh, how you use how, of the styling of the code as well. But they are fairly similar in the code size in this case. And a good exploration topic on that part is that you can compare different declarative UI frameworks on this example, like Swift UI and Compose and React Native. And you can see which of them are like based on how easy they are to be used, the readability of the code, state handling in different uh, of declarative UI frameworks and support for the custom UI components. That was pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really nice to see. Uh, and uh, I mean, there is a lot of things we could talk about uh, concerning this. And I, I could just give my perspective on, I mean, uh, in uh, I think most of our uh, programs, we uh, we we kind of stop at at the the PVA stuff with with creating progressive web applications using JavaScript and and the, all the the standards that are are taken and that is I mean you, you talked about it could take weeks for <laughs> for for a sensor or whatever to be be implemented in Re React Native and it could take years for 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 the same sensor to be be taken as a web standard and and but and and that also means that okay for for it to show up as a web standard, it should probably be be like implemented on the same way on on every device and stuff like this. So, so not all all things are even uh, uh, considered to be uh, part of the web standard. So and then you need to, to use uh, something like React Native or go on the native path. Um, but really interesting to see. And uh, I mean, uh, most of our students, I guess, try. React Native or Angular or, or some framework uh, during their education. And, and uh, it seems like it's not 
that big, that uh, large of a step to 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 go go to React Native and, and start your uh, journey on being becoming an Android or iOS developer. Um, thank you so much. There are there any questions? I have the wrong. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I will just show the question and we can take them. Is there, will there be any server-side rendering frameworks like a Next.js native? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, actually, no, there isn't because uh, due to the nature of how React Native works, uh, it needs access to, uh, you know, native components and uh, that are part of the SDKs uh, of each platform, so um, there is no way to to basically have uh, some some other uh, like a server uh, build build the uh, you know the native components for you and then deliver them to the app. It has to happen in the app itself, um, and also you, you know you might want uh, apps that are not dependent on uh, on a backend at all. So it needs to be able to work offline as well. Perfect. I think that's it. I'm ready for lunch now. I uh, hope you guys are as well. And I would uh, say thank you very much. I hope we can stay in touch and maybe we can have like a, uh, some of you coming in having just a short guest lecture in a course that is specific to, to your topics. That would be super interesting, I think. It was really nice meeting you and I wish you best of luck and thank you so much once again. Likewise. Thank you very much for having us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>